What's up, Kitty? Hey, guys, how you doing? Welcome, everybody. What's up, Kitty? Let's see what's going on with her. Sorry, guys. Let me see Kitty's paw. You okay? Yeah, guys, sorry about that. I didn't mean to see you see my bald head. Two things today. I found out yesterday my cat hurt her left front paw. So she's here. It's not too bad. She's not in like screaming in pain. So she's moving, but with her paw, she's like gently touching the floor and lifting it. So I had called the vet to see. So she's doing okay. She's resting, sleeping, eating. But she's not able to move as quickly. So right now she's here. Because when I'm by the table, she likes to get attention. But her left front paw, she did something to it where she's like limping on it. She can't touch it completely. So I got to give her a little attention. But remember, all these are creatures of God. God loves all his creatures. He loves human beings more than any other creature. But he does love his creatures. He loves his creation. He created animals because he loves animals and he's given us dominion over them and we are told to love them, care for them. Now those anim animals that are dangerous, predatorial, that will try to harm humans, then we have to protect humans from them. But when it comes to cats and dogs, we need to show them love and compassion and mercy, right? So my heart hurts for this little cat but she's okay. She's not in pain. She's not screaming. She can lie down and resting. But guys, I do appreciate your prayers for her. So guys, help me to help you. Stay focused and ask the Holy Spirit to fill all of us. But do pray for her, Kitty, right? In fact, here, let me show you what the Bible says about the righteous. Proverbs 12, verse 10. See, the Bible, let me, let me remind you guys. The Bible is supernatural. The Bible is divine. It is the voice of God. If you want to know where you will hear God's voice clearly and perfectly, we all agree, all major branches of Christianity agree, if they haven't gone the route of liberalism, <clears throat> that the Bible is God's perfect word. There is no true Christian that denies it. The ancient churches, these apostolic traditions, all believe and affirm the Holy Bible is God's perfect word, His voice historically accurate. That's the view of the fathers. That's the view of the Orthodox, Catholic, Oriental Orthodox, Coptic, Syrian Church of the East. I'm not talking about the liberal wing. Liberal academia, liberal professors who have gone against the ancient tradition of the churches. If you are Orthodox, if you're Catholic, Oriental Orthodox, look into the tradition of the church historically before the rise of liberalism, before the Enlightenment. And you will find in all the statements of your particular church, and you'll find statements of the fathers where they affirm the Bible is perfectly preserved, historically accurate, but that it has a very deeper, spiritual, richer meaning so that these historical events are meant to point to greater spiritual truths you will not find them attributing myths, legends, fables to the Bible. And you'll find them all affirming that the Bible is God's voice. This is the historic position. So you don't have to affirm sola scriptura to believe the Bible is historically accurate, perfectly preserved and inspired. Because this was the view of the fathers and these churches and if you read their official statements, you'll find this is what they teach, right? Are you everyone with me there? Everyone with me there? Are you listening? Help me to help you. I'm doing Creator Studio, so the lag time is less. So everyone got it, right? So we all agree. The Bible is God's voice, and it is miraculous. It's supernatural. It's one of the proofs, believe it or not. It's one of the divine proofs that God is real because its structure is miraculous. Its depth and beauty is miraculous. When the spirit illuminates you to dig deep, you walk away in awe and you're blown away how amazing this book is. It truly is. 
And it all is designed to point to Jesus Christ. Now, the Bible is miraculous because it has something to say about everything, even about animals. Here it is, Proverbs 12, 10. Our brother, Protestant believer, Lord bless you. Thank you for joining us, brother. I know you're busy. Just posted it from, I believe, the authorized version. Now, you guys know my position. I love the King James Version. I believe it is God's perfect words for English-speaking Christians. And by perfect, I'm using it in different sense. I mean that it perfectly accomplishes God's purpose in sanctifying his church, transforming his church, and preserving his church as Holy Spirit uses that word to transform us to be more like Christ, right? I'm not saying that the translators were inspired to be flawless. That's not how I'm using the term. But anyway, though I believe that for the benefit of those whose mother tongue is not English, I'll use other translations, preferably New King James Version. But here, let me show you what it says, okay? Proverbs 12, verse 10. Beautiful passage. Tell me the Bible is not amazing. And I'm going to give you another passage. Deuteronomy 25, verse 4. Watch here. Look at this, guys. Tell me this book is not amazing. Dewey reigns. Yep, Dewey reigns. A righteous man regards the life of his animal. Isn't that beautiful? Proverbs 12, verse 10. Thank you, Protestant believer. He's posting for us. So pray for him. Pray he passes with flying colors. Pray the Lord will bless his family. Pray that his daughter will conceive children. So brother, thank you. He's posting verses for us. Thank you. Notice what it says. A righteous man regards the life of his animal. Caught it? But the tender mercies of the wicked are cruel. I'll explain what that means. But notice, those who are just and righteous in God's sight show love and compassion even for animals. Now watch here. In the Torah, given through Moses, look at God's command how to treat your beasts of burden. Those animals that work for you. Watch here. Deuteronomy 25, verse 4, Michael Lawler. You shall not muzzle an ox while it treads out the grain. Now, let me explain these passages. Pray the Holy Spirit fills me and you. Pray that we stay focused and the Holy Spirit saves me from error and stammering and confusion. Recall Scripture perfectly, exegete Scripture perfectly, and obey Scripture perfectly to show our love for the Lord Jesus Christ. Hit the like button, subscribe. Now, let me explain what that means. When an ox is treading out the grain, the field for you, working for you, don't be so cruel and wicked and evil to muzzle it so it doesn't eat from the grain. That is cruel and you're being evil. Let the ox eat because the ox is serving you, working for you. Be compassionate and let the ox eat. Don't muzzle it as it's shredding the grain for you, right? That is cruel and evil. Now, there is a principle called from the lesser to the greater. If God shows this much love for an ox, how much more love will he show for human beings that are the crown of his creation? In fact, Paul uses this passage to prove that elders and teachers are worthy of financial compensation from Christians. Do you believe that? He uses this passage. Do you guys know that? He uses the passage about being kind to your oxen who work for you and don't be so cruel and miserly to muzzle them. Let them eat from the grain as they're treading it for you to show love and compassion. And he uses that to show that God has enjoined upon Christians to financially compensate and feed elders and teachers who serve you the word of God. Now, where am I getting it from? Since Protestants here. 1 Timothy 5, 17, 18. Pay attention to verse 18, guys. Watch. I want to break these passages now. 1 Timothy 5, 17, 18. Doesn't help. Today's my cheat day, and I feel like I'm in a coma. My next cheat day is going to be Thursday. God willing, if I survive, because it's Thanksgiving. So that's why I did it today. Now watch here. Let the elders who rule well. Now watch this. It's conditional. Not any elder, not a wolf in sheep's clothing, not a false bishop or priest who is of the devil and bringing destruction to the church, going against the teaching of the church, but an elder who rules well. Pay attention, guys. Rules well, meaning he rules in accord with God's will, and he seeks to practice what he preaches. Be counted worthy of double honor. Twice the honor than someone else. The elder, that's the bishop. Why? Especially those who labor in the word and doctrine. Now, you caught it, guys. Let, let, the class has begun. Listen. Especially those elders and those individuals who labor in 
studying the word, meditating on the word, and breaking down the word, and teaching the word, and then teaching you sound doctrine. Why? Look at here. Here's the reason. Verse 18. For the scripture says, you shall not muzzle an ox while it treads out the grain. Well, that's about oxen. And that's Deuteronomy 25, verse 4. Now, the second citation, Paul is quoting from the Gospel of Luke. He's quoting verbatim Luke 10, verse 7. And the laborer is worthy of his wages. So you see what Paul did? He said, you are commanded by Scripture to provide financially for elders who rule well and those who teach you the word. And he gives you two passages. The second of which is from the Gospel of Luke. Verbatim, it's from Luke, where Luke quotes our Lord Jesus when he sends out the apostles to preach the gospel. And he says this to them. Here it is, Luke 10, 7. And remain in the same house, eating and drinking such things as they give, for the laborer is worthy of his wages. That's what Paul just quoted. Do not go from house to house. Now, I've already discussed this in previous sessions, but for those of you who may be hearing it for the first time, isn't it amazing that Paul, in one of his last letters, in fact, 2 Timothy most likely was his last letter. 1 Timothy was written shortly before that. He's in prison. He's about to be beheaded, according to church history. Quotes the gospel of Luke. Luke being a Greek physician, a disciple of Paul, one of his companions, who's not Jewish, who's not an apostle. And yet he quotes Luke's gospel as scripture, combining it with Moses' writing, classifying Moses' writing and the gospel of Luke as scripture. Together they are scripture singular, showing you the early reception of the gospels by the churches. That once they were written, the apostles and their followers recognized and affirmed these books were inspired by the Spirit and they're part of Scripture. You guys see that? Go ahead, move on. Don't mind me breathing. Uh, cheat day and I'm recovering. Bad timing. You know, I just had some, my typical buffet. But everyone catching, because this is your class done for you to benefit you. Trusting the Holy Spirit will work through me and he'll be our teacher to build you up. Okay. Now, but... The most important thing you should ask yourself is this. Good to see you guys. Jazzy, Ortho Christos, Kiri Eleison, all of you. Good to see you. Brandon, everybody. Why would Paul quote Deuteronomy 25, 4, which has nothing to do with humans? To prove and enjoin on Christians their obligation. It's an obligation. It's obligatory. It's not a choice. To obligate them to provide financially for qualified elders and those who teach the word. How does Deuteronomy 25, 4 prove that? It's about animals. So let's look at it again. If he can post it, 1 Timothy 5, 18. Let me explain how he can do that. It's the argument from the lesser to the greater. Right? I need to recover. Next cheat day is Thanksgiving Thursday. Ooh. Boy, I love them cheat days, then I hate them. May God give me supernatural Divine, miraculous, spiritual strength, self-control, self-restraint, self-constraint. Okay, now let's let's go deep, right? That's why you're here. You want to go into the meat of Scripture, and I trust the Spirit will work through me so we can plunge the depth of Scripture. For the Scripture says, you shall not muzzle an ox while it treads out the grain. Now, the second citation, I can, I can understand. That's the words of Jesus that Luke recorded by inspiration of the Holy Spirit, where Jesus says, you, my apostles... My disciples, my laborers, who've been appointed by the Spirit to preach, teach, convict, and build, you are worthy of your wages. Those who hear the word and accept it, those whom you teach and feed spiritually, they are obligated to support you. But what about the first one? It's about animals. What about the first one? Well, why and how does this justify supporting elders? Very easy. Paul is arguing from the lesser to the greater. What is his point? If even God is concerned about showing justice to an animal, an ox, that's inferior to humans, but still loved by God, because God loves all his creatures, everything he made he loves, right? Though it's fallen and tainted. If God is concerned with the well-being of an animal, that if an animal works for you, you better show love to that animal and kindness and feed it, how much more human vessels create an image of God or giving you the most important food imaginable, spiritual meat. You understand the principle? 
arguing from the lesser to the greater. God bless you, Tippy. You see how that works? So you see God loves animals like my cat. So pray for Kitty in Jesus' name. Then in a few days, her leg will be better. And I'll take care of her for as long as the Lord wants me to take care of her because I have to love her and show compassion. And I wasn't a cat person, but because of her, I'm in love with cats now. I don't know what to do. Even when I leave, I have to get a cat sitter. So pray for her. But you get the principle now? Now I'm going to give you another, I'm going to give you another passage of scripture. Love you, Kitty. Jesus bless you. Matthew 10, 29 to 31. Matthew 10, 29 and 31. Another, uh, depends, Don Data. If it upsets you that I'm Assyrian, yes. If it upsets you that I'm not, then no, I'm actually Afrikaans. Matthew 10, 29 and 31. Guys, pay attention, everyone. And I need feedback because that's what we do. It's a class. We want the Spirit to teach, right? Are not two sparrows sold for a copper coin? Now he's talking about birds. And not one of them falls to the ground apart from your father's will, meaning... That the father is even concerned with the life of his animals, even birds. And a bird will not die unless the father has determined it's time for that bird to die. Right? But the very hairs of your head are all numbered. Do not fear, therefore, you are of more value than many sparrows. You guys caught it now? If your father loves sparrows and provides for sparrows and cares for sparrows and their lives are in his hand, how much more does he love you and he's concerned for you? See how that works? The lesser to the greater? Makes sense before I move on? Can't move on if you're not getting it. So point of this being a class. We go slow. We're not in a rush. Because if you're not listening, you're not learning. And if I speed it up, you won't learn. We want to go as slow as possible. That's why I drag. And people say, why do you drag? Because I want you to learn this. I want the Spirit to enable me to make these issues clear. And by the Holy Spirit, you understand them. Because once you understand them, you absorb them, make them second nature, then you share them. See the cat sitting right here, so I got to be careful. So you catching it now? So isn't the Bible beautiful? You see how beautiful it is? But we need to plunge the meat of Scripture. So let's begin in the Lord's Prayer, because we're going to go slow, very slow. I got so much to discuss. And one advantage of being humanly alone, meaning without my daughters, even though it's not an advantage not to have them, but you have to see it from God's perspective and trust as well. I have nothing but time to study, to pray, to worship, to meditate, to write articles, to do sessions, because the Lord put in my heart to do full-time ministry. But it would still be beautiful if I can do that with my daughters. But until then, until then, I will endure and make the most of it because better men of God than us, better women of God than us, lost their families for years, like the case of Joseph. Joseph was 17 years old when his brothers betrayed him and sold him in slavery. And he did not see his brothers or his father until he was in his 40s. Do you know that? Genesis 41, 47. When was Joseph exalted? To be the savior of the earth, Lord over the world, second to Pharaoh. Okay. One second. When? Genesis 41, verse 46. When? 41, 46. My apologies. May the Holy Spirit perfect my ability to call every jot and tittle and destroy my forgetfulness and obey his word and live it out for the glory of the Father, the Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, Holy Spirit. When? Watch here. May the Lord sanctify me and perfect me to hate sin, sin less, and recall Scripture more perfectly and obey the Scriptures completely. Not for the praise of men. May he destroy our pride, our arrogance, ulterior motives. Look how old he was when he was exalted to become the Savior of the world, Lord of the earth, second to Pharaoh. By interpreting Pharaoh's dreams correctly and then storing up food when there was plenty in storehouses. So when the famine hit for seven years, people could go to Egypt. And then they would buy food for survival. Look at this. How you doing, S.J. Thompson? Yeah, I actually rescheduled my stream because you had yours at 1. I was going to go at 1, so I decided, when I say 1, 3 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. So I changed it for your benefit, S.J., because I know you did a session on why Protestant apologists are becoming Catholic. I guess you're prophesying, because you're prophesying that I'm Catholic, even though I'm still on a journey studying 
the differences between the Orthodox and the Catholic, specifically when it comes to the papacy. But I don't know if you were prophesying, sister. All right. Uh, swear me, are you a dog? If so, which kind of dog are you? A rabi bastard dog who's who <clears throat> is in the streets all night barking and foaming? Anyway, Genesis 41, 46. Joseph was 30 years old when he stood before Pharaoh, king of Egypt. Joseph was 30 years old and made the Holy Spirit plant every jot and tittle of his word in the depth of our souls, spirits, hearts, minds, and tongues to recall them, love them, and live them out. Okay. Notice he was 30 years old. Now, do the math with me, guys, as I walk you through this. He was 30 years old when he interpreted the dreams for Pharaoh, and then Pharaoh exalted him to be in charge of Egypt. 30. Sound familiar? The Lord Jesus began his ministry at the age of 30. But let's go beyond that. And Joseph went from the presence of face of Pharaoh and went throughout all the land of Egypt. Now, Joseph interpreted Pharaoh's true, true uh, two dreams. Okay? Two dreams. Okay? Both dreams meant that there would be seven years of plenty, plenty of food, followed by seven years of famine. And so he then advised Pharaoh, in the seven years of plenty, store up food in <clears throat> food houses. Store up food in food houses so then when the famine hits, people will come to you and buy food and you'll pretty much own them and they'll survive. So now let's add 14 years to the age of 30. How you doing, Arabian Princess? Good to see you. Okay. He was 30, seven years of plenty, 70 years of famine, 14 years. So now he's 44. And then when the famine hits bad, that's when his brothers come looking for food in Egypt. That means from the time he was 17 up until he was at least 45 years old. Pharaoh, I'm sorry, Joseph had not seen his father. His mother, even though it was really his aunt because his biological mother died, Leah, or his brothers, especially his baby brother, the youngest brother, Benjamin, who was from the same mother. Can you imagine how many years that is? Count, guys, tell me how many years that is. 17 and let's say 45. 30 years old. So when he interprets the dreams, seven years of plenty, seven years of famine, 14. So that means he's 44, and that's when... His brothers would have came up when the famine was hard. So we'll say 45. From 17 to 45, that was 28 years, right? 28 years he had not seen his beloved father, his baby brother, or the brothers that betrayed him and sold him into slavery. 28 years, my brothers and sisters. This is why the Bible is beautiful. Let me tell you why the Bible is beautiful. Well, it, it's God's word, and God is beautiful, so his word is beautiful. But the Bible is an accurate historical record of the lives of actual people and their actual experiences, and it doesn't sugarcoat it. It doesn't sugarcoat it. So you get the warts and all. You see these holy men of God at their best and their worst. For example... Judah, who is part of the covenant community, a son of Jacob, Jacob, from whom Jesus will descend, who was gifted with rulership. You go to Genesis 38, and Judah was a whoremonger. He slept with prostitutes because he slept with his daughter-in-law that he didn't know was his daughter-in-law because she pretended to be a prostitute and a whore. And he went in and slept with her and got her pregnant unbeknownst to him, and it was his daughter, Tamar, daughter-in-law. This is Judah for you, Genesis 38. Reuben sleeps with his father's concubine. And because he slept with his father's concubine, Jacob cursed him and said that you have now lost the right of the firstborn. You will no longer be given the status of, the honor and the inheritance of the firstborn for what you did, because you went up into your father's bed and you exposed your father's nakedness. So the Bible is an honest record 
of the lives of these people, not sugarcoating their moral imperfections and failures for two reasons. Number one, to show you that even the best of saints can be the worst of sinners and that we are not to make them more than they are or idolize them. And number two, that even if these people with their atrocious sins can still be forgiven by God, preserved by God, loved by God, and used by God, and God works through them to bring about a greater good, there's hope for all of us. Right? What about Samson? In Hebrews 11, Samson is mentioned in the Hall of Faith as one of the men of faith. But go read Judges 16, verse 1. It says, when Samson was at Gaza, he found a whore and slept with her. These men slept with whores and prostitutes. Does that mean God approved of it? No. Let me tell you how the Bible works. Judges 61. Here it goes. Thank you. You posted it. Now, Samson went to Gaza and saw a harlot there, a prostitute whore, and went into her. What does it mean? It means that God doesn't sugarcoat. Imagine the Bible as, let's say, a news agency or a newspaper that accurately reports events as they take place, even the most heinous events. That doesn't mean the news agency or the newspaper or the news reporter approves of those acts, but they have to record and report those acts accurately, even acts that they hate and detest. And that's what you have in the Bible. You got it? That's what you have in the Bible. Everyone learning? I, like I said, I'm going to take my time. It doesn't help that it's a cheap day. Glory to the Father, glory to the Son, glory to the Holy Spirit. May the Lord reinvigorate us, rejuvenate us, replenish us, refresh us, <clears throat> regenerate us, revive us for the glory of the Father and the Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, and the Holy Spirit. Just to tell you, I'm getting old. One thing I ask the Spirit in His love and mercy to give us all the gifts of faithfulness, to be perfectly faithful, to have perfect hope and not doubt Jesus is returning, and perfect love and manifest the fruits of love to actually <clears throat> prove our love by our deeds towards the Lord and one another. And may the Holy Spirit perfect the gifts he's given me for ministry, such as recall of scripture and destroy my forgetfulness to never forget scripture. But did I just say the Lord's Prayer? Why don't you get lost, dude? No one wants to talk to you and no one can hear you. See how stupid you are? Get out of here, you dumb little cow. Anyway, I didn't write. That's the time I'm getting old, Anila. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, our Father, who art in hell, uh, heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory, both now and forever, unto ages of ages. In the name of the Father. And of the Son, of the Holy Spirit, in Jesus' name, glory to the Father, glory to the Son, glory to the Holy Spirit, in Jesus' name. Yehovah Rapha, Yehovah Rapha, Yehovah Rapha, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, save me from stammering and stuttering and from my lisp. Save me from error and misinformation and loosen my tongue, Holy Spirit, to be used for your glory, to speak the words that you want me to speak, to magnify the Lord Jesus Christ as he increases in us and we decrease. Feed us the flesh of Jesus Christ. Give us the blood of Jesus Christ and do that for our loved ones, my daughters. And seal us for the day of redemption and embolden us to love Jesus Christ by our deeds, even unto death. Glory to the Father, glory to the Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, glory to the Holy Spirit. Now, okay, now, David, the new theologian, I challenge you to come on my Skype because I'm going to bury you in what you just said about Jesus is in hell. You may have confused your mother with Jesus because we know anyone who gave birth to you is the bride of Lucifer. In fact, you may be the son of Lilith because definitely no sane woman would give birth to a spiritual whore and a dog like you. So you were either birthed by a female dog in heat and the Shia found her or by Lilith, the bride of Lucifer, because you are the son of Lucifer and I'll crush your mouth and muzzle you for the glory of Jesus Christ. You sure you didn't say that? Here, let me play. Let me say what you said. To be Catholic Orthodox, you have to believe that all those Christians are not Catholic. 
since Jesus from since Jesus are now because you are an illiterate buffoon, you are stupider than Muhammad. You can't even spell a coherent sentence because you're more illiterate and stupider than Muhammad. Look how you wrote this. From since Jesus are in hell. You see how stupid you are? Now, I know Muhammad was stupid and illiterate, but you're on a whole nother level because you can't even form a coherent statement when you speak, let alone when you write. Look how you wrote it, jackass, you brain ass. You wrote it to imply that Jesus is in hell, you stupid monkey. No disrespect to monkeys. But now, if you're saying that Catholics and Orthodox think that those who are not Catholic Orthodox are in hell, okay, then you must be one inconsistent, dumb, braying ass, born of a female dog, because you have Orthodox who will say the same thing, Catholics who say the same thing, and Protestants. Yeah, there are Orthodox who thinks others are going to hell. And Catholics think that some may be going to hell. Those are the extreme ones. But what do you do with Protestants? What do you do with Baptists who think that if you are Catholic Orthodox, ipso facto, you're going to hell? What do you do with Baptists who think the Pope is the Antichrist or Seventh-day Adventists or Reformed Calvinists? You inconsistent demon. Now get him out of here. Get him out of here. Now you can get this guy out of here. Now, glory to the Father, glory to the Son, Lord Jesus Christ, glory to the Holy Spirit. When they start manifesting, that means, here, hold on. Hold on. Are you that fat slob that lives in his uh, mommy's basement and collects welfare? When are you going to get out of your mother's basement and go get a job at Burger King where you belong instead of letting mommy support you even though she has to go and prostitute herself with the Shia. Hey, ultimate fart, you dumb bastard. Hold on, I want to put you on speakerphone. Is it true? Hold on, it's ultimate fart head. Hold on, hold on, hold on. Hey, ultimate, ultimate uh, fart. Last time, can you mute the computer, you dumb bastard? I can hear myself through your computer. Mute it. You dumb. See, ultimate fart, he loves to come on my channel and Christian Prince's channel. And he likes to just get abused. What's wrong with you? Why do you come to my channel and Christian Prince's, uh, Prince's channel? Just because I believe that you are, as God said, you are ignorant. Of what ignorant? By the way, can I ask you a question? Why is it last time on Christian Prince's channel you use the word, and ladies, please cover your ears, and if there's kids, and that's why Christian Prince banned them. It was like two weeks ago. You're saying, like, you're imitating, I don't know, what your conversation, you said motherfucker. Why did you use that term? Do you remember that? That's what yes, got you banned from Christian yes, Prince. Yes, 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 yes. So you admit you said that word. You you were saying motherfucker, right? Yeah, I, I did say the word. I did say the word. Why? If I would have said it, if I would have said it to my, Christian Prince is saying, I, I insulted my prophet. Why would he? Why would Christian Prince hang up on me for insulting my own prophet? Yeah, but I'm saying, why? Why do you use that term? Why did you say motherfucker? I don't get it. Okay, let me tell you how it went. He was asking me. We, we was talking about. He was asking me if Muhammad was perfect. I said no. He made mistakes. Uh oh. He sinned. He said, he said like where? I said. Uh, then I quoted him uh, 66 one right? Why did he prohibit what 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 God had made love? Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. Then he asked me, what was it? What did he break? What law was it? Yeah. I said, it doesn't matter. What matters is anything that God made lawful, he cannot make it unlawful. Okay. That's all that matters. This is general. And then he said, I said, okay. Uh, he said, no, 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 you got to tell me. I said, it doesn't matter. And then he insisted. I said, okay, let me give you an example. If I said, if me and you, Christian Prince, are, are brothers, we got the same dad. He said, okay. And Dad took us to the house through uh, through the house. He said, "Okay, don't go in this room. Don't go in in this room. Don't go in this one. Don't go in this one." And we got some spots in the house that we cannot go in. It's prohibited by Dad. We cannot enter those rooms. I said, "Okay." He said, and all of a sudden, you Christian Prince came to me and was like, "Hey, hey, brother Ultimate, uh, can we can we go and see what's going on in in the room? Dad don't want us to go there." I said, you motherfucker. What did you say again? What would you say to your brother again? I said, you motherfucker. 
That's it. Stuck for all stuck. So I'm talking to him. Okay, but you you know. This is not the same. Yeah, but ultimate Sam. fart. You, lame. Sam. Yeah, no. Let me tell you something. Sam. You know it's. Sam, listen, he could, he could ask me to apologize or anything. I was just making it fun. They they love me. Those Christians. Yeah, but my friend, my friend, do you, do you understand what motherfucker literally yeah. means, right? Do you know what it Sam, literally means? What, what is CP not saying to us? What is CP? He never called by my name. You you all called me ultimate for. Because you come in, you insult, you cuss us. I got your ultimate. See, you're talking over me. This is why he blocks you. I still have you recorded talking about that you're going to sodomize my daughters. I still have it recorded a year ago. Don't think I forgot that. It's here. Okay, but okay, but can I? You answer the question. You didn't answer the question. So this is why you get blocked. Do you know what motherfucker literally me means, right? I know. What does it mean? That's what he said. Yeah, but what is the literal meaning of it? That's what he believed Jesus is. Yeah. Okay, see, now you insulted Jesus. You see that? So this is why I'm going to take it easy on you when I insult you. But what I'm saying is, okay, do you know what motherfucker means? I mean, what's the literal translation of motherfucker? Do you know what it means? What? I know what it means. Okay, tell me. You didn't give me a definition. What does it mean? It's it's what? That's what you give your God to do. No, uh, motherfucker means someone who fucks your mother. So you just told your brother he fucks your mother. Did you know that, right? So did your brother fuck your mother? Is that what she did? Yeah. He did? Because motherfucker means someone who fucks your mother. So you just said to your brother, I want everyone to hear it. You just said, motherfucker. So you said, my brother, you fucked my mother because my mother's a whore, which is why she gave birth to me. So why did you acknowledge your mother is a whore and that your brother fucked her? Can you explain? Yeah. There you go. See how stupid the guy is? You see that's how stupid this guy is? <laughs> right? He was he was blaspheming Jesus, by the way. They see, and I turned it against him. He just told you in a story that his brother did that. That's why I told you, ladies, cover your ears. All right? Now, this guy stalks me and Christian Prince. Yeah. You see how he tried to blaspheme Jesus and slander Jesus by saying, that's what you say about your God. I said, no, that's what you said your brother did to your mother. So that's it, guys. You heard it from the horse's mouth. You heard Christian Prince blocked him for this reason because he was on Christian Prince's live stream and he was using his analogy to mock and insult and blaspheme Jesus Christ. And Christian Prince cussed out his mother, rightfully so. But I want you guys, I have a session over a year ago where he came in saying he would sodomize my daughters. I have it recorded. I even have it titled. Go watch. Muslim, demonic Muslim manifests. That was him. So a year ago. So I got him on record saying he'd sodomize my young girls. And now you heard him say, you heard him say, right? Now I'm going to use, I'm going to say it like the Filipinos say it. Because in the Philippines, the Pinoys, they can't say F, right? They say, P so he just said to his brother, you mother pucker. So he just said that his brother pocked his mother. So he admit his mother did incest with his brother, giving birth to this bastard. <laughs> I can't laugh. I cheat day. Oh, all right. We ready now? You guys ready now? Mother Parker. Did you know that? It's okay, Kiri. Jesus is almighty God. Why do you think he raised up someone like me and Christian Prince that are not politically incorrect. We will insult you, humiliate you, cuss you out, insult your mother for giving birth to bastards like you when you mock and blaspheme Jesus Christ. That's why white churchianity doesn't work, Kiri Desun. It doesn't work, white churchianity, right? May the Lord Jesus destroy white churchianity because it's garbage, produces a bunch of effeminate sissies, which leads me to a comment, by the way. We're going to read some comments. We got a lot to cover. This was just sent to me by a brother in the Lord. He just told me this right now. He sent it to me about 30 minutes ago. He goes, some more evidence. Watch here. Here it is. Some more evidence that the aggressive debate style matters. I'm speaking to a Christian who's struggling a bit. And one of his reasons was that the Christians are always on the defensive in debates and aren't offensive. Let me repeat. I'm speaking to a Christian who's struggling a bit. And one of his reasons was that the Christians 
are always on the defensive in debates and aren't offensive. I just gave him a playlist of debates from you and Christian Prince. So hopefully he watches them. Your white churchianity, not trying to be racist or woke, but I'm being honest, your Western churchianity, may the Lord Jesus destroy it because these white churchians have monopolized what a Christian is supposed to look like or act. May the Lord erase that form of Christianity and bring true, con true conviction and revival. Now, a praise report. I just got this in the comment section and I pinned it. Well, not pinned it. I posted it in the community section of my YouTube channel. Praise report. A person who was a Calvinist for 25 years left Calvinism and now he's become Orthodox. Let's read his, the praise report. Praise report. Here you go. Guys, here's the link. That's why do me a favor. Check daily the community section, community section of my YouTube channel because there I post links to my latest articles or videos that I think will be beneficial or testimonies. So when you go to my YouTube channel, please subscribe if you haven't subscribed and go to the community section. So I just posted this. And uh, Christian, totally agree, Sam. That guy that wanted to debate realized he won't win. Hadn't even given him your Skype ID yet. Exactly. So click on it. Let's rejoice. May God bring hundreds of thousands of people out of Calvinism. And he used us to destroy Calvinism because it's not biblical. It's blasphemy against the God of the Bible. And may the Lord convict these Calvinists to repent. So here it is. Praise report. Mr. Panchok. Let me read. I was Calvinist for almost 25 years. I now believe that Calvinism, along with its closest sisters, who are rooted in Luther's heresy, is, in, is as evil as Islam. Hallelujah. That's why, praise the Lord, he brought me out of it. All Christians do agree that St. Paul's admo admonition to the Galatians, chapter 1, demands strict adherence to the gospel that he and the other apostles had brought to them. Yet there is absolutely no historical evidence. This is why that fat slob had to butcher the fathers and cite a forgery to his shame and humiliation. And the Lord has now disgraced him. And it's not going anywhere until he repents and apologizes before he becomes too proud and the Lord hands him over destruction. There is no historical evidence that the common evangelical teachings about grace and the nature of grace align with apostolic teaching. Absolutely no evidence. And that's his words. Look. Amen. There you go. There you go. Here, let me put that. I'm not done yet. I'm going to post it. Here it is. That's his own words. And I gave you the link, guys. So daily check my community section for updates. This teaching encourages the professing Christian to behave wickedly while at the same time believing himself to be eternal secure. He's not lying. Secondly, a misapplication of scripture taught dogmatically as truth becomes a mocking post of our Lord and also leaves justified reason for leaving the faith when the truth of the matter is revealed. As for myself, I had learned to base my faith not upon, quote unquote, the Bible, but rather upon the resurrection of our Lord. Because the Bible is all about Jesus and points to Jesus. We don't worship the Bible. We worship the God revealed in the Bible and use the Bible to bring us to Jesus. Now, look what he says. Today, I am a happy, not miserable, schizophrenic as a Calvinist, which we all were. I am a happy and joyful follower of him, Jesus Christ the Lord, within the Orthodox Christian tradition. There you go. May God use me to bring droves of Protestants and Calvinists out of that and back to the ancient traditions. Glory to the Father, glory to the Son, glory to the Holy Spirit. Be it Orthodox Catholic, that's between you and the Lord. At least you're in ancient church. I know the Orthodox don't think the Catholic, not all Orthodox, I don't mean to generalize. The very hyper-Orthodox think the Catholic Church is completely lost. Not all of them. They, there are many who believe they're true believers, vice versa. But that's your battle between yourselves because you guys were one and you are ancient and you re recognize you are ancient, but then you believe that one of you fell away. No one denies that Protestantism is recent. Nobody denies that. Protestantism goes no farther back than to the magisterial reformers or deformers. But even among these traditions that are in schism, and there's no love lost. They'll tell you, yeah, the Bishop of Rome, the Catholic Church is ancient, but fell away. 
Or yeah, the Orthodox Church is ancient, it's true, but it too fell away because it's not in communion with the Pope. It needs to be in communion. And these other, that's one thing they agree though. All of them are ancient. All of them trace themselves back to the apostles. All of them were one until schism occurred. And it started, let's say, with the Assyrian church in the 5th century due to the rejection of the title Theotokos and due to the use of the Aramaic word Knuma. And then with the Oriental Orthodox, and I would include the Coptic church, the debate on the natures of Christ and the wills of Christ, right? Mana or some of them don't like when I say monophysitism. Some say I should say miaphysitism. Okay, whatever it is, and monothelitism. Well, these were one up until that point. Until the 5th century, 6th century, they're all one. So they are historic. And they'll admit, we were one. But from the 400s, 500s, we started splitting. And then the Catholic Church and Orthodox Church, their schisms slowly started simmering until it became full-blown. And you'll hear people refer to the Great Schism of 1054. Okay, so there you go. That is sufficient for me to acknowledge these churches and honor them. Why? It's sufficient for me to know that the Oriental Orthodox churches, I include the Coptic Orthodox, the Eastern Orthodox, Greek Orthodox, Russian Orthodox, the Catholic, Roman Catholic, Eastern Catholic, Byzantine Catholic, Syrian churches, that they were ancient, they are historic, they do trace themselves to the apostles, and they were one before the schism. That is enough for me to honor them and love them, though I may disagree with some of them. But that puts me in a position of being trying to be humble and show humility and never condemn them as a false church. Right there. All right. You're ancient. Who am I to sit in judgment of you? So no matter what church I embrace, I will not go the route. I'm letting you know right now. I'm not going to go the route of condemning these churches. That's one reason why I don't want people to know what church I land in because I don't want people to follow me and I don't want people to be heartbroken because they made me more than I am, which is another point I wanted to address. Believe me, all these points I'm addressing. Remember, this is a class. I'm here to teach you to the best of my ability by the power of the Holy Spirit, asking the Spirit to come to the forefront and guide my tongue and guard me from error and purify my motives to do it for the glory of Jesus Christ and bless you. So. Bear with me because these are things I need to talk about. One thing I needed to talk about was this. The personality cult, cult of personality. It is a sad thing that I see. People are idol factories. We tend to idolatry. It's part of our fallen nature that Jesus is purifying us and purging us from. So we are drawn to human beings that we think are excellent superb, exceptional in whatever field. You have humans worshiping actors. You have humans worshiping athletes. You have humans worshiping religious figures. Why? Our hearts are idol factories. And when there is a charismatic person, dynamic, our hearts are drawn to that person. And we make that person an idol. And may God destroy every idol and all idols in all our lives, in my life, and guard me from allowing anyone to make me an idol. And we find it in Christianity. And I'll give you an illustration. Today I was trying to listen to the debate between Ubi Petrus, Ubi Petrus, and Militant Thomas. Now, let me be honest with my Orthodox brothers. Ubi Petrus was not your best representative. Now, to be fair, I didn't listen to all of it. Why? Very unprofessional in the sense is Mike wasn't sharp. And as Militant Thomas was giving his presentation, you'll hear him saying, hey, can you take a few minutes because I'm getting my slides ready? To me, that was unprofessional. Secondly, I didn't think he addressed some of the citations of the Father sufficiently. I had heard of Ubi, but I didn't know of him. And I thought he didn't represent the Orthodox position that well. You need someone better. Now, with that said, what I noticed was, now both speakers told their camps. Ubi said, Orthodox, don't attack anyone in the comment section because it'll be used against me. Militant Thomas said, Catholics, likewise, don't attack anyone because it'll be used against me. Say, Law, look at those rabid Catholics, rabid Orthodox. Guess what happened? 
Jay Dyer showed up. All hell broke loose. Why? I'm not blaming Jay Dyer any more than I would blame Tim Staples, any more than I would blame, let's say, Trent Horn. People have turned these figures into celebrities and idolized them. You've made these people idols and you've made them more than they are. And you need to repent. You need to. It's disgusting. I saw it with James White and I see it now with certain Rogerians that they idolize them, they, these men, that they can do no wrong. And when you criticize them, their demonic fanboys and fangirls come out and attack and slander you. This is why I'm always rebuking you. I'm rebuking you, love. Please do not idolize me. I'm not saying you are. Please do not idolize me. For the love of Jesus, may he save you from that and save me from pride and arrogance and never allow myself to be idolized. And I'm not saying you are, but I have to say this. Please don't do it. It's disgusting. It's disgusting to hear Orthodox parroting Jay Dyer word for word because they've lost their personality and it's now Jay Dyer's personality coming to the forefront. The guy that cussed out my mother, the guy that on Facebook that I exposed when he cussed out my mother, he was trying to parrot Jay Dyer's terminology, but he was too stupid and ignorant to understand the terms because he's not on Jay Dyer's level. But being a puppet, a parrot, a disgrace to his church, being a di di diarian, diorite, he's parroting him, but he's too stupid to understand the, the terms and their implication. We need to stop. Not only stop because you need to guard your heart. What if Jay Dyer falls like Ravi Zacharias fell? Like James White is now falling due to his arrogance and disgust. Then what happens to your faith? If you have put your hope in one man and not Jesus, you will be disappointed. Your faith will be shattered and you may turn away. What happens if Jay Dyer leaves orthodoxy? I'm not saying he will. Not attacking him. Just understand. What if he says, you know what? I was wrong. Orthodoxy is not it. Then what? What are you guys going to do? Right? Look what happened to me. All those years of being a Calvinist, I love Calvinism. And now the Calvinists are irate, sad, depressed, or angry. And some of them are now slandering me, slandering me making it personal because they can't believe they lost me. Well, I don't give a damn that you lost me. I never belonged to you. I belong to Jesus. I belong to Jesus. You belong to Jesus. I answer to Jesus. May his truth prevail over my lies and errors and mistakes and human tradition. And may he give me the power and the confidence to repent and admit I was wrong and accept the truth no matter what the cost. He's worthy. Jesus is worthy. Are you with me there? So what happens? You got to stop. No more idols. And another reason why you got to guard your hearts. Now being transparent. These, By the way, all of this was part of what I was going to discuss today. I was going to discuss these. So I'm not going off topic. And I asked the Holy Spirit to guide me to talk about those issues he wants me to address and may he save me from Aaron Samory for the glory of the Father, the glory of the Son, the glory of the Holy Spirit. Uh, Ryan, can you shut the hell up and don't judge me for judging people because I'm battling my own demons like a filthy demon like you? Shut up and get out of here, you hypocrite, you filth. You see what you just did? You just sat in judgment of me, not to judge people because they're battling demons, and I'm battling demons like you, so why are you judging me, you hypocrite, <laughs> on you? I hope that made you happy. Now get the hell out of here, you hypocrite, you fake, dumb, stupid retard. He just did the very thing he accused me of doing. <laughs> Where? Hold on. Let me call Ultimate Fart so he can cuss you out. Let me call Ultimate Fart. So he's got words for you, buddy. You see the hypocrisy, right? They, they think they're spiritual and pious, but the dumb spiritual bastard just did the very thing he accused me of. Judging me for judging people because they're battling demons, even though I'm battling demons like this dog. Let me call, hey, uh, Ultimate Fart, start a new account, and I'll, I'll put you on because I want you to cuss this guy out. Tell him what you said to your brother, what your brother did to your mother, because I can't swear. I'm holy and sanctified. I can't say, mother pucker. All right. Now, with that said, let me make another point. Satan knows you like the back of his hand. Satan knows you. Hey, Gabby, you don't like it, Gabby Thifter? Then don't marry someone like me, Gabby. Go find you an effeminate man 
who's a Christian, so you can control and tell them what dress to wear, what color, and what toe and nail polish to put. And you can then string them along, Gabby. So go find you an effeminate man to marry because I'm too alpha male for you, girlfriend. I'm just alpha male. Just too alpha. <laughs> oh, man. That's why my channel will never go viral. And I'll never be invited to any conferences. Gabby, did you see what Gabby said to sister? Because Gabby's a female name. See what she said? Sam, I was thinking about proposing to you, Sam. But I see I can't control you. You're too alpha. I need a beta. You keep speaking to people like that, Sam. You need to be a mirror of Christ through your behavior. This is not Christian at all. So I need you to be a beta so I can then control you. And I got 20 dresses for you to dress every day. I got a black one. I got, and for for Black Friday, by the way, don't, you, and I got nail polish and uh, for your toes because I need a beta that I can control, Sammy. And you are just one hot, fine, gorgeous looking man, but you too alpha for me, girlfriend. All right. Now, Satan knows us like the back of our hands. I should say Satan knows us like the back of his hand. May the Holy Spirit save me from error from stammering and confusion and guide my tongue to glorify Christ and not be politically correct. And they, by the way, they keep coming back. These people that attack me, they can't get enough of me talking about making me an idol. These guys, I'm their idol because they keep coming back. Dude, get out of here. Don't come back. You don't like me. No, Sam, we can't do that, Sam. Sam, we can't. We, we, we just love to hate you. And you're so gorgeous. You're just an idol. I think of you day and night, Sam. I'm Gabby. I got a picture of you, and I I burned candles to your picture, Sam. Okay, but now all seriousness, let me do this. Okay, in Jesus' name. Satan knows us like the back of his hands. He knows our weaknesses and sins. Another reason why it's dangerous to make idols of people is because you're going to make those people that you idolize succumb to sin. For example. Satan knows my weakness. And what is my weakness? And I want you to hear this out. This is all part of the session. Those of you coming, I already plan to talk about these issues. Believe me. Satan knows that I've always struggled with low self-esteem and self-worth and affirmation. All my life, I've been criticized by the people I love the most, I'm not trying to play pity party. And I've always wanted their affirmation. And that left a hole and emptiness in me. Wanting the affirmation specifically of a woman. Why? Because of my mother. My mother, who I believe is with the Lord, she's resting. She was a very tough woman, tough, verbally tough and physically tough. And she left an emptiness in my heart to want the affirmation of a woman. And because I didn't get it from her, because I got criticized and she didn't mean to do it, it made me feel less of a man low self-esteem, and created a void that Satan realized. This guy needs affirmation. He needs to be affirmed to feel worthy. So if I do not guard myself, if I do not protect myself from praise, then Satan can use that to tempt me. Because if you're born of the Spirit, Satan can't control you. He can tempt you, but he can't control you. If you yield to the Spirit. He will use that to tempt me. To want to feed my flesh because I want affirmation so I can feel worthy enough. And then this will result in me getting puffed up and then thinking I'm more than I am. And then I stumble and fall and shame Jesus Christ our Lord. That's what happened to James White. He started believing his hype. Now he thinks he's God's gift to Christianity when he's a joke. So you are also... Being a stumbling block to these men when you praise them and idolize them and quote them and imitate them and parrot them and lavish praise on them. Because if these individuals don't guard themselves, they will then start to slowly <clears throat> succumb to the hype and start believing they are as great as people think they are. And then they become puffed up and useless and then set apart for destruction. Classic case, James White. Do you find anyone more repulsive than him? Is that what you want to happen to these people that you love? Is that what you want to happen to, let's say, Jay Dyer or Tim Staples or Jimmy Aiken, whoever it is? 
Is that what you want? Stop parodying them. Stop lavishing praise on them. Stop quoting them as if they're infallible. Stop doing that. Yield to the Holy Spirit. Trust the Holy Spirit. Say, Holy Spirit, show me where Sam is wrong. And give him the grace to see where he's wrong and the humbleness to accept it. And protect me from making anyone more than they are. Because I cannot make Jesus enough. That's why our Lord said in Matthew 23, 8 to 10. Matthew 23, 8 to 10. You're welcome, brother. Mando, thanks for sharing that, brother. So many of us have the same issue. Validation, brothers, make us stumble because it's ours. Exactly. And Satan knows that, brother. But you know, Amanda, what the Lord says? Be wise as snakes, innocent, harmless as doves. Know your enemy's strategies to guard yourself against them, but don't adopt his tactics. So that's why I know Satan knows what my weakness is and knows how to get me. Here's what our Lord said, Matthew 23, 8 to 10. Here it is. But you do not be called rabbi. For one is your teacher, the Christ, and you're all brethren. Let me explain our Lord's words here. Guys, listen, it's class. This is all for you. I believe the Holy Spirit wants me to share this with you. That's why I'm doing it. Do not call anyone on earth your father. For one is your father, he who is in heaven. And do not be called teachers. For one is your teacher, the Christ. Now, I already did a session explaining what this doesn't mean. If you read Jesus' words in context in the Kant's New Testament, he's not saying you can't call someone rabbi or teacher or father. It's much more deeper, more profound than that. Now, you guys want me to break down the context, what Jesus is saying? It's about an attitude. It's about your attitude and disposition. So you want me to break it down? You guys ready? What he did mean? Because I've done sessions showing he didn't mean you can't call someone father. Because then that would contradict the rest of the New Testament. Or you can't call someone teacher. Find those sessions. Here's what he's saying. In the context, he's talking about the religious leaders of Israel. In the context, he's saying they sit on Moses' seat. So do what they say, but don't do as they do because they say and but they don't do. So do what they tell you from Moses. When they say this is what Moses said, do it. But don't imitate them because they say, but they don't practice what they preach. And this is why he says your attitude should be such. Watch here, guys. Your attitude should be such. Never look to any human guide as being absolutely authoritative over your life where he speaks with utter perfection flawlessly and you're bound to believe everything he says because that attitude and allegiance is to be given to the father and me alone that's his point that's his point you don't view that spiritual leader and give him that type of allegiance and submission that you do the Father and the Son. You only give your wholehearted allegiance and never question, but perfectly submit to everything the Father and I, the Son, tell you. Everyone else, you learn, you listen, but you question and test and don't blindly follow any one individual, parroting any one individual. This is why I can tell you Augustine is right here. He's wrong here. And why can I say he's wrong? Because I see that the Christians before him unanimously believe this. And he comes and he contradicts the unanimity of the church. You get my point? You understand? Why I can tell you Augustine here made a good point. But be careful because Augustine's view about predestination or Augustine's view about original sin goes against the unanimity of the fathers that came before him or the consensus and those who came after him. So when Augustine is in the minority, when he's alone, we respect him, but we don't follow the minority unless there's overwhelming evidence to do so. It's Augustine's predestinarian views that led to Calvinism. Not saying Augustine was a Calvinist, but his views of predestination and combating Pelagius became the precursor for this blasphemous demonic doctrine of Calvinism. Because John Calvin thought he was parroting Augustine. Everyone clear on that? And I was just told by William Albrecht, my brother in the Lord, even the Catholic Church, not just the Orthodox, the Catholic Church, and he sent me an article confirming it. 
The Catholic Church rejects Augustine's view of original guilt. Glory to the Father, the Son, Holy Spirit. What is original guilt? He just sent it to me, by the way, on the phone, and I'll bring him on to confirm. What is original guilt? It's something I learned from Calvinism that not only do we inherit a sinful inclination proclivity from Adam and Eve, because Adam and Eve, now human bodies, natures are born, bent, and part of your human nature includes a sinful proclivity that later on causes you to sin against God, which you need to yield to the spirit to control. Augustine went a step further. He believed original guilt that even infants could be condemned to hell if they die in infancy because they share in the guilt of Adam and Eve. You want me there? And after reading the passage as a scripture that I actually read yesterday in the q and in the Q&A, and I saw that's not what the Bible teaches about children who before... They are aware of right and wrong. God views them in mercy, love, and compassion and says, you got to be like this child because the kingdom belongs to, belongs to these children. So it's the reverse. If you don't act like a child and submit to me as a child does to his or her parent, the kingdom is not yours. It actually teaches the opposite. And Romans 7, 7 to 12, demolished total depravity, destroyed the life of Calvinism that we're born dead and said, no, we're not. We're born alive. But once we're aware God exists, his law exists, and I need to submit to it, that's when sin springs into action, causes me to sin. And as I sin, that's when I die. I'm not born dead. I'm born alive. But it's inevitable I will die because it's inevitable I will sin. And they would butcher passages. You were dead in trans transgressions. Yeah, notice, dead in transgressions because I committed sins. I died. I wasn't born dead. So you understand these points, why they're important to keep in mind? I wanted to share this with you. That's why I said it's going to be a long session. I hope it's a fruitful session because I have a lot of time to share with you. Is that clear to everyone? These issues are important. Now, this is going to lead me to a discussion of the church, all part of the Trinity. Guys, believe me, there's a method to my madness. I ask the Spirit to guide me to talk this way if you want me to, and obviously the Spirit is giving me License to do so, because I want him to lead, not me. Let's talk about the fathers again. This is going to tie in with the Trinity. Again, now, rule of thumb. Pay attention. Rule of thumb. I th I, Journey, did you just listen to me, man? Or do you want me to send you back to the West? I'm going to make sure you do a detour and go back to the West. Did you just listen to me, Journey to the East? Are you here wasting my time so I can block you? Rule of thumb. Rule of thumb. When you find the church as a unified body, listen to me. Listen to me. Wait, wait, Kim. Wait, wait. So are you confused, Kim? Kim, are you confused? Hold on. I want to see if Kim is confused. Tobia Singer teaches the opposite of me. So are you? Hold on, guys. Don't block him yet. Are you confused? And you want me to help you? Say, yes, I'm confused and help me. Hold on, guys. He'll be going west. Go west. You'll find peace out there. Go west. I know it's a 60-second day. Kim, say, I'm confused. And Sam, can you help my confusion? Because I'm ready to help you. Guys, we got about another two-hour session. So just sit in. Hopefully she's doing better. Yeah, let me she'll pray for her. Come on, Kimmy. All right. Now, when you find the church as a unified body, meaning... For the first 300 years, listen to this rule of thumb. This is what got me to change. Because for the first 300 years, the church was one. It started in the 5th century, 400s, the schisms, breaking away. When you find for the first 300 years, even up into the 5th century, let's say, 400s, the church as a unified body, believing X, teaching X, take that as the work of the Holy Spirit, guiding the church, as a unified body to agree, this is the truth. Because if you believe the Holy Spirit is almighty and he's going to preserve the church, then the Spirit will never allow the church to agree as a unified whole over error. Because we believe the promises of Scripture. That's rule number one. Are you with me? We got rule number one? 
That's rule number one. Brethren, help me. That's the first rule. If you follow these rules, you will find your path home. Can you guys? I don't know. No, I don't hear anybody. Oh, sorry about that. Okay, good. Rule number two. Rule number two. When you find in the first 300 plus years a consensus regarding a doctrine or belief, then it is always good to go with the consensus than the minority unless you have overwhelming evidence that the minority is right because it's less likely that a majority or consensus would all see something <clears throat> incorrectly. That's the second rule. Go with the consensus. If they're unified, end of story. Right? There's no debate. Thirdly, when you find neither unanimity or a consensus, but the fathers are all over the map on an issue and they're not agreed, then you are free. Take that as the mercy of the Holy Spirit and working through the church in such a way to allow them to disagree and not come in agreement in order to allow Christians of various groups the freedom to debate, argue, in order to sharpen one another. Right? You with me there? That's the third rule. These are the rules that the Spirit used in my life to bring me on this journey to the fullness of the truth, believe it or not. Okay? Because of my love of Scripture, knowing that God's promise in Scripture cannot be broken, this is what led me to this path of changing. Okay, so that's the third rule. Fourth rule. These are rules. Take them, meditate on them. And if I'm wrong, the Spirit save me from error and save you from this. Okay, fourth rule. The fourth rule. Okay. So you want help, right? Okay, you want help? Here you go. Here's your help, buddy. I'm going to send you to North Korea so you can talk to your namesake, Kim. Ask him to help you, sir. The fourth rule. Since the Holy Spirit is sanctifying the church until Christ comes, there will be a progression in understanding, a progression in <clears throat> clarifying, illuminating, explaining the core doctrines of the faith. What Catholics call development of doctrine, which was championed and made famous by a convert to the Catholic Church, Cardinal John Henry Newman. Now, let me explain that, guys. We expect that as time goes by, the Holy Spirit will be working through each and new generation of Christians to illuminate them more and more because you can never plunge the depth of Scripture. So each generation builds on the generation before, and the Holy Spirit enables them to go deeper and plunge more deeply and find out even greater riches and greater clarification, illumination of doctrines established. So what does that mean? As time goes by, there's going to be development in doctrine. The question becomes, is this a development that's faithful to the deposit of faith based on and springs forth from that which is established? Or is it an aberration and a divergence? That's the debate. So expect things to progress. Expect doctrine to be more developed, further clarified, further expanded, and expounded upon. But what you need to do, and ask the Holy Spirit to show you is, is this really a development or is it a perversion, an aberration that is now betraying the deposit of faith and not accurately based on or explicating it? This is why you have the debate on the filioque, que, filioque and the papacy. Because one group says filioque is an addition. It's not faithful to the ancient deposit. It's a perversion. The other group says, says, no, it is ancient, it is true, and it is faithful. Okay? One group says the papacy is an abomination. It's a distortion. It's an aberration. It's not faithful to the ancient belief of the church. It is now fallen away. It diverges. The other group says, no, it is faithful, and it's based on it. You see the point? If you remember these rules... 
Yeah, no, I don't. It was just briefly in passing. We're going to have people discussing the filio quay and more in depth. If you remember these rules, then by the power of the Holy Spirit, you should be guided aright. You should be guided aright. For example, some of you are aware that Origen and his instructor taught technically universalism, right? I keep forgetting Origen's instructor. Was it Cyprian? Cyprian, right? There are statements in their writings that teach that God at the end will basically redeem everyone, <clears throat> including Satan. Now, that is an opinion held by Origen and his instructor, but it's not widespread. It's not unanimous. It's not the consensus. You see my point? You get my point? But you get what I'm saying, Abdul Masih. You get the point. Here you have, and wasn't his instructor, Cyprian, guys, correct me. I'm going by memory. May the Spirit perfect my ability to recall the names of the fathers and their teachings as he enables me to recall scripture and exegete it correctly. I'm a work in progress. Give me the name of Origen's instructor. I believe it was Cyprian, wasn't it? Not Cyril. Was it Cyril? Come on, guys. Come on, you church historians. You guys should know it, man, more than me. He had an instructor that also taught universalism. Clement, huh? No, someone told me that Origen inherited his universalism from statements made by Clement. Double check, Ian. They go, it didn't, it didn't originate with Origen. There are hints in Clement hinting at universalism. Double check, Ian. Unless you're telling me that these individuals that I look to for information on the church misled me, and I should trust you with a name like Ian, and then you have the name Cyclops, Ian Cyclops. I don't trust Cyclops. What, what's the point? Origin is out there. Tertullian, due to following a false prophet named Montanus, following the heresy of Montanism, even though he was orthodox in his Trinitarianism, ended up being rejected as a church father. He's only a church writer. But you get the idea, right? Now, let me give you two issues that I, I know for certain because I've read and studied. Are you aware that Justin Martyr believed that the father is nameless by nature? He's beyond naming. That the father has no name, that he's nameless. Because origin, I'm sorry, Justin Martyr thought, Justin Martyr thought, if you had a name, that means someone gave you that name and that someone has authority over you. Since there's no one beyond the father, the father is nameless. It's the son whose name is Jehovah. This is what Justin Martyr taught. And I have an article on it quoting him. You guys want the link to that article? Okay. You want the link to that article? So I'm preparing you for the Trinity. This is all part of the discussion and intercession. Right after this, we're going to go into intercession. You want me to give you the link to the article? Yeah. I'm not making it up. And this is where Unitarian heretics misrepresent Justin, saying, see, for Justin, the father was a greater God. Jesus was a lesser God, which is a lie from the pit of hell. Because of the fact that Justin said the father remains in a super celestial place, cannot be seen, and he's above naming. The God who is seen is Jesus, and his name is Jehovah. Here it is. Here's the article. Justin Martyr on the nameless God. Justin Martyr on the name of God. Here's the article. Right, I'm not. I'm not lying. I quote from him directly from his, his his writings. And here's a source that sums it up. Okay, Church Fathers Saint Justin Martyr by Thomas V. Marus. And then I quote Martyr Justin Martyr. Justin is of the opinion that because God is without origin, he is therefore nameless. Because anyone who has a name has been given it by some elder. Now. Why am I mentioning this? Because you will find that many of the fathers were Greek philosophers and or pagans that when they converted to the faith, used their background as philosophers to then communicate the truth of Christianity to Greek pagans and philosophers. And at times they did so contrarily to scripture. Why was she... Yeah, why did someone do that to Harriel? She just gave the thumbs up. 
Another example of philosophy affecting the view of a Christian in articulating the nature of God in a way that we who follow Scripture would not accept. Are you aware that Tertullian, Tertullian thought, much like Salafi Muslims do, Tertullian thought the Father, because he has a substance, has a body, because Tertullian believed substances have bodies. So if the Father has a substance, he has a body. Now, why am I mentioning this? These views are the minority. They're not the majority. They're not the consensus, and they're not the unanimous view of the fathers. Here are two outstanding Christian apologists, philosophers, but they were mistaken. Does anyone deny that the father's name is Yahweh? I don't know of any. Does any church, Catholic, Orthodox, Protestant, deny the father's name is Yahweh? I don't know of any. I know the Mormons think the father's Elohim, but they think he was a man. But Justin Martyr taught, due to his philosophical background, due to the influence of philosophy, well, if you name someone, then you have authority over that one. And everyone who has a name has been named by someone. So if the father has a name, then someone named him. But how can that be? There is no greater authority than the father. Well, maybe the father named himself. Justin, ever thought about that? Right? So there he's mistaken. Tertullian, the father having a substance means he has a body. Well, if we now, in light of progressive illumination, now that we have received greater illumination, clarification by the Spirit regarding the meaning of Scripture, in light of advancement in science, if time, space, and matter are part of creation, and time, space, and matter came into existence, and God is the creator of all creation, he created time, space, and matter, then God, by his very nature, is immaterial. He's incorporeal, meaning he doesn't have a body. He's spaceless and placeless. He's a being that doesn't need space or place. Therefore, when we talk about God's substance, we're not talking about something that is material, concrete, or composite. By substance, we, we simply mean God's mode of existence. Well, if God is, then he exists. He is existence. No more, no less. You see what I'm getting at? You understand why I took 30 minutes to torture you and bore you with necessary information? Information you need to know on your journey to more accurately understand the Bible and the early church's role in being used by the Spirit to preserve those scriptures. Pray for me, I can kill this mosquito, man. Okay? So, Justin Marty is a minority of minorities. Okay, I don't know of any other father. There may be a father there or two, but I am certainly unaware that the fathers as a whole or, or as a consensus thought that the father was nameless. And I'm sure there were a few fathers that thought if the father has a substance, he has a body due to their Greek philosophical background and due to perhaps statements of, of the Old Testament where God is envisioned as being embodied. I would be shocked if this was the consensus, right? The majority view, and in light of modern advancement in science, where creation includes time, space, and matter being brought into existence from nothing, ex nihilo, and the God of the Bible creating all that, then by his very nature, he is spaceless, placeless, incorporeal and material, but after he creates time, space, and place, he can then enter into his creation, manifest in a body, in a shape, in a form, and engage and interact with time as it unfolds, because he's personally active with his creatures. Well, did you know that your mother's right arm is bigger than her left? Do you know what that means? Ask the Shia. They'll tell you. All the nights they did muta with that spiritual prostitute and whore. Ask her and the Shia, why is my mother's right hand bigger than my left? Denny. Everyone got it?
Everyone got it? Do we understand those principles, those rules? If you understood what I said, if you got it down by the power of the Holy Spirit illuminating us to understand, this will help you on your journey. This is why I always ask people, when it comes to the Filioque, what did the fathers teach for the first 400 years? In fact, from the second century up until the schism, can you show me what the fathers taught? So I can see, did the consensus of fathers teach X or Y? Or did they teach X as a unified whole? Or did they teach Y as a unified whole? Because at the end of the day, philosophy doesn't really matter to me. Because people try to use philosophy to deny many core doctrines of the faith, such as the Trinity. So you're not going to convince me by philosophy. What you're going to convince me by is exegesis, showing me in the Bible, exegeting it accurately, and the history of the church, the church's historical interpretation. That's where you're going to get my ears. So what I'm looking for is, what did the fathers of the 2nd, 3rd, 4th, 5th, 6th, 7th centuries teach up until the schism, 1054, regarding the filioque? Filioque. I know it wasn't in the original Constantinople <clears throat> ratification of the Nicene Creed. Even Catholics admit that it was added later. But is that an addition that betrays what the fathers taught? Or is it an addition that was made that is faithful to what the fathers taught? So far, are you with me? Everyone with me? What's going on here? What up, Kitty? She's there. Oh, she's okay. Hold on, guys. Sorry. What happened, Kitty? You okay? Yeah, she's hurting. Pray it get, gets better because if not, I have to take her to an emergency. In Jesus' name. Yeah, I feel bad. Just want to make sure you got these points. I hope you felt it wasn't a waste of your time. I really believe that the Spirit impressed on my heart to share these with these with these with these principles with you. Please, Spirit, save me from error, from confusion, from stammering, and make my voice passionate and pleasing to the ears of your servants. I really felt the need to share these. I've been trying to share these, but in the previous sessions, I had to delete those sessions. I wanted to lay these rules. Everyone got it? Stuff you need to know if you're serious students of the Bible and on a journey. You guys got this? The rules I told you, if it's unanimous, unified church, when they were one and they taught this as a whole or the consensus, right? And development of doctrine, where doctrine develops accurately and it's a linear progression where it goes from what was taught and builds on that foundation accurately as opposed to diverging from it. And when you have some minor opinions amongst amongst the fathers those opinions cannot be determinative and normative when it goes against the clear teaching of scripture or what the church teaches as a consensus and a light of progressive illumination everyone got that now we're going to talk briefly about the trinity and procession of the saints are we ready now let me know if you're ready Really, guys, I'm doing it for you. If you feel like it is torture, let me know. God has blessed me to know these things for my own journey, for my own growth. I know these things for my own journey, my own growth. But if I believe God has called me to teach, then it is my obligation, duty, then to share these things and trust the Spirit to help me to share them clearly without error. So we can know the fullness of the truth because we're all on a journey until the Lord returns or summons us. Now, the Trinity... The Trinity, a basic doctrine of the Trinity goes like this. Basic doctrine of the Trinity goes like this. The biblical doctrine of the Trinity is simply this. Pay attention because sometimes you get caught up and you get lost in the philosophical models developed by Christians to explain the Trinity. The basic doctrine of the Trinity based on scripture, goes like this. The Bible teaches there's one supreme God who created all things, 
who sustains all things, who's personally involved in overseeing all things, and is concerned with the salvation of humanity. Okay? The Old Testament, this God's personal name is Yahweh or Yahweh or Yehovah. You get my point? Everyone want to pronounce it. Yod, hey, vav, hey, yod, hey, wow, hey. Four letters, four consonants in Hebrew, the Tetragrammaton, right? Now, the same scripture teaches the Father is that God, the Son is that God, the Holy Spirit is that God, but the Father is not the Son, and He's not the Spirit, and the Son is not the Spirit. But the Father is in intimate relationship, communion, and love with the Son and the Spirit. And the Son is in intimate relationship, communion, and love with the Spirit. So the three are in love with one another, are in perfect, inseparable communion with one another, and do all things together perfectly, inseparably. That's the second truth of Scripture. Okay? The one true God... Old Testament covenant name, Yahweh. The Father is that God. The Son is that God. The Holy Spirit is that God. And these three are not the same self because the Father, Son, Holy Spirit are in love with one another, in communion with one another, always perfectly work together inseparably. So that's actually three, not two. And then a fourth element. If you want to say third element, that's fine. If you want to combine the fact Father, Son, Holy Spirit are that God and they're not the same self as one, that's up to you. Whatever you want to break it down, it's irrelevant. Is that the Son then became flesh, became man, was born as a man, born as a human, took to himself another nature, the nature of humanity, and now has united himself to that nature forever. Okay? These are all biblical facts so basic biblical doctrine of the Trinity is to simply say there's only one almighty creator, creator God, sustainer, life giver, preserver, savior, covenant name Yahweh. The Bible says the father is that God, the son is that God, the spirit is that God, but they're not the same self. The father, son, and spirit love one another, are in communion with one another, and always perfectly and separably work together. So they're not the same self. And then the son became flesh, is in flesh, took on a human nature, became human. And he's now united himself to that human nature forever. That's it. That's it. Now, the question becomes, how do we then formulate and articulate those biblical truths, systemize, systematize them in such a way that will make sense to a certain extent to finite imperfect temporal minds this is why we have so many models it's not as if christians came up with a doctrine trinity and came up with a model for the trinity and then forced the bible to agree with that model this is where the heretics go wrong either because they're ignorant or dishonest it's not the christians decided one day to come up with the trinity and then come up with models for the Trinity and force the Bible to agree with that model. It's the other way around. Christians who love the Bible, who let the Bible speak clearly, who sought to understand its message, saw the Trinity. And then they wrestled to try to figure out a model that best systematizes all of these revealed truths. We got that? So far, am I clear? Trust the Holy Spirit to anoint me to speak clearly, perfectly, passionately, powerfully, accurately. Glory to the Father, glory to the Son, glory to the Holy Spirit. All right? So then you have social Trinitarianism and its various facets. Latin Trinitarianism. Monarchy. That's This is where Christians are wrestling and debating. How do we best systematize? And explain the clear, irrefutable, biblical data. How do we do it? Because the Bible doesn't do it for us. The Bible is not a systematic theological treatise. Treatise. The Bible is not a systematic theological 
book. The Bible is a collection of inspired books recording actual historical events where God interacted in miraculous and dynamic ways with people. And these books were written by some of the witnesses to these events or those who knew the witnesses. So when it comes to the New Testament, to take a term from someone I don't like, the authors of the New Testament were either eyewitnesses of Jesus or the disciples of eyewitnesses, and they were what we call experiential Trinitarians. What does that mean? They experienced the Trinity as a miraculous dynamic reality. The apostles walked with Jesus in the flesh. They heard God the Father's voice audibly. Peter, James, and John did so when they saw a cloud visibly descend on them and heard the voice of the Father audibly. And then they, again, they heard the Father's voice audibly in John 12, 28 to 30. And then they saw the Holy Spirit manifest as tongues of fire and settling upon them on Pentecost. And they would hear the Holy Spirit directly as he would appear to them and speak to them and instruct them. So they were experiencing the reality of the Trinity. So they didn't bother themselves in explaining or systematizing that reality. You with me there? When you experience a reality, you could care less whether you can explain it or systematize it because for you, it's a reality. You're seeing, you're touching, you're hearing, you're sensing. It is a reality that is beyond comprehension, a reality that you cannot deny. And for you, that's sufficient. Seeing that reality is all that matters. Whether I can explain it or systematize it was of no concern for the eyewitnesses to the majesty of Christ and their followers because they were experiencing the Holy Spirit dynamically. The Spirit appearing as tongues of fire, speaking to them audibly and revealing to them revelation from heaven. Or in the case of the apostles, seeing Jesus, God in the flesh, or seeing the Father come down in a cloud or hearing his voice audibly. They experienced that dynamic reality, so they didn't have time, nor did they feel the need to then systematize it and explain it. They just gave you their experiences that were real, which they experienced, a reality that's infinite, and they recorded those experiences for your benefit. It was left for the later generations to then try to systematize it. And I'm going to give you a testimony of what I mean. I'm going to give you a testimony of what I mean. The other day, I, re I replayed the testimony of this Jewish woman who's now a follower of Jesus Christ, who loves the Trinity, who at the age of 16 died and had an out-of-body experience. What she says at the end encapsulates and perfectly captures what I just said. Encapsulates and perfectly captures what I just said. Now imagine the apostles and their followers, look what she's going to say. This is exactly what the apostles were experiencing in their followers, a reality that was more real than the material universe because the material universe is grounded in that ultimate reality called God because without God, there would be no material existence, no material reality. He is the ultimate reality that grounds all other realities. You with me there? So far, you with me, right? Ariel, I'm going to show you that Jesus is called Jehovah and the Spirit's called Jehovah as well. That's their name. Let me play that clip, okay? You're going to hear what she says. I played it. In fact, when I had StreamYard, Protestant was with me, and we actually showed you the clip. Her testimony is featured in Lee Strobel's documentary, Case for Heaven. She's one of the bona fide, verifiable, Near-death experiences, out-of-body experiences, genuine, and it led to her conversion. Here it is. Because you're going to hear what she says about her experiencing God as a man, Jesus, and God as a living, dynamic light who's pure love. Listen to her words. Short, here it is. And this is what I mean the apostles and their followers were experiencing. Okay, here it is. Here's the link. Save the link and watch it and re-watch it, especially in times of sadness, when you get sad, all right? 
get loud at guitar. Listen. I grew up in Council Bluffs, Iowa, in a Jewish family. My dad had a mantra. Jesus Christ is the biggest hoax ever perpetrated on mankind. Christians are idiots for having hope. Your life has less significance than the smallest speck of dust in this infinite universe. We were in an accident where another horse ran into my horse. She reared up, flipped over backwards with me on her back, and fell across my body. As she hit my chest, I immediately left my body. I was up 30, 40 feet in the air. I just left. I knew I was dead. And as I was up there, I noticed that even though it was a cloudy day, this light was shining over my shoulders. There was a light over my shoulders and it was illuminating everything in front of me. And I realized there was a person standing right there and he moved forward and he was standing, we were up in the air, but we were standing. And uh, he is standing right next to me and I looked at him and he looked at me and it's like, oh Jesus, oh, hey. It's like, how you doing? I knew that I had known him my entire life. It was not a surprise. I was not shocked. I was not thinking, what is a nice Jewish girl like me seeing Jesus? Why am I seeing Jesus? No, I knew this man. I knew him. And um, he, he was smiling at me. We were talking, but I mean, it's not like my mouth was moving, but I know we were talking. Catch it. One thing common about these near-death experiences, out-of-body experiences, and my brother had one of them, and I'll share it again. I'll share what he had, my oldest brother. They say, when you meet each other, you don't see the mouth moving, but you communicate. It's like mind to mind, telepathically. That's a common, common feature in these experiences. And he very quickly showed me my life. I didn't have a whole lot to see because really and truly I was a good kid. And he, he uh, I saw him from the time I was formed in my mother's womb. Ooh. He had been with me. He had. I'm going to give you all the biblical verses confirming her experience, which is why I believe she saw the real Jesus, because the Bible confirms her story. Not she confirms the Bible. The Bible confirms her story. Notice what she said. From the time of my mother's womb, he was with me, right? I knew him. He knew me, right? Pay attention. Listen to what she's going to say, because I'm going to give you the Bible to confirm her experience was from the true God. Always been with me. Always. All my life. And... um you know, just when I used to talk to God at night when I was a little kid, he'd been there. That He'd been there sitting by my bed. I saw that. After this life review, and I was no longer really looking at the ground, he took my hand and we flew. We surfed. I didn't go through a tunnel. A lot of people, I've heard people say they go, went through a tunnel. No tunnel. It was like we had this wave of light under our feet. And I know my feet were bare because I could feel the wave of light under my feet. And it was pushing us forward. And we were holding hands and flying like Superman and Lois Lane. So faster and faster and faster, I saw a light. What's that is? And it was getting closer and closer. And it was, it's a living light. Living light. And it's the brightest thing you can imagine that I could look at it. And you would think it would burn you, but it doesn't. It's perfect. It's blemishless and it takes up that light took up my entire field of vision it was infinite in its scope but it was alive and that light was love you hear that? and jesus took me directly into the light and the next thing i knew i find found myself sitting on god's lap and I have a granddaughter, a two-year-old granddaughter. And, you know, if she needs comforting or she wants to be held, she, she'll sit on my lap and bury her, her face in my chest. And I'll put my arms around her and she'll, she'll have her arms around me. That's what I was doing. I was like a little kid. I was sitting on Cod's lap. And I buried my face against his chest. And I put my arms around him. And he had his arms around me. And I never, ever wanted to leave. I didn't want to leave. I just wanted to sit there forever and be held by God. To the point. And it's, I can't explain how God can be a light and God can be a man and God can be love. I, I can't explain it. Now listen. I can't. But that's what I experienced. Bam. Did you hear it? I experienced the Trinity. I can't explain the Trinity. That's what I was talking about when I said the apostles, their followers, the New Testament writers, 
experience the Trinity dynamically, miraculously, in a way that we will experience the Trinity when we see the Godhead visibly and hear them audibly, right? And they didn't worry about having to explain it, just like her. I can't explain it. I saw it. It's reality. That's who God is. I saw it. That's ultimate reality. I cannot deny what I saw. I can't explain it. That's the point. You understand that? Let me play that clip one more time. Now give, give you the biblical basis for her testimony. Here you go. Three. Uh, hear it again. This is what we mean by experiential Trinitarians. One more time. Listen. Can't explain by God. And it's, I can't explain how God can be a light and God can be a man and God can be love. I, I can't explain it. I can't. But that's what I experienced. There you go. Now, I gave you the link. She's featured in the case for heaven, Lee Strobel's documentary, and I have the book. I didn't read the book yet. I believe she's there. She's one of these verifiable, actually verified, near-death out-of-body experiences because she was crushed. They have medical records. She was 16. Now, I'm going to give you the biblical basis for experience, but remember what I said. The New Testament is the inspired record of human beings that experience the Trinity as a living, dynamic, miraculous reality. Father appeared in a cloud, and they heard his voice audibly. Matthew 17, 5. Also found in Mark 9, 7. Right? Luke 9, 34, 35. They also heard the Father's voice audibly in John 12, 28 to 30. <clears throat> Jesus is God in the flesh, and they are beholding him, touching him, kissing him, hugging him, walking with him. Right? And then the Holy Spirit that appeared in bodily shape like a dove that John and Jesus saw, or as tongues of fire that the disciples and the apostles saw as he came and filled them and miraculously empowered them, speaking various languages and allowed others to hear those languages as a sign Jesus is Lord, he's alive. Or the Holy Spirit appearing to them in dreams and visions, or Christ appearing to them in dreams and visions, angels appearing. You know, all of these realities that they experienced saw, heard, and touched. And they knew this was ultimate reality that grounded this material reality. And the last thing they thought about is to systematize their experience or explain it. You see my point? So all of these models are attempts of explaining this ultimate reality that is God, the God of Scripture, the God of history, is the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, and Jesus being God in flesh. Jesus being God in flesh. Yeah, what about Judas? Here, I'm going to send you to say hi to him. First of all, when you see Judas, give him my regards because I won't see him where he's at, but you'll end up seeing him. Anyway, so you with me there? Everyone got it? All right. So all of these models are simply that models of explaining the clear biblical data. So the, your first priority, your first concern is to prove the biblical basis for the Trinity, the biblical data. And all you need to prove, and I've given you dozens of sessions, hundreds of articles, clear, irrefutable exegesis by the grace of God's Spirit, working through me and others who are not worthy, but He is worthy that He uses us and manifests His life through us to show you the clear, irrefutable basis for the Trinity. What's the basis for the Trinity biblically? One Almighty God, Yahweh, creator of all creation, sustainer, life giver, preserver, Redeemer and Savior. The Father is that God. The Son is that God. And the Holy Spirit is that God. But the Father, Son, Holy Spirit are not the same self. The Father, Son, Holy Spirit love one another, are in love with one another, and perfectly, inseparably work together, showing they're not the same self. Because they're in communion fellowship with one another. And the Son became flesh and united to himself a human nature that he has forever. That's all you need to establish. Once you establish it, then you plunge this ocean of Trinitarian philosophical thinking and argumentation, social Trinitarianism, Latin Trinitarianism. And I subscribe to the monarchy, monarchia. But you get my point, right? So when these Unitarians or these Muslims try to show that there is no one model accepted by Trinitarians and one model is critiqued by a proponent of another model, what they're failing to tell you is these models are all developed by believing Trinitarians. 
All of these models are developed by Trinitarians. Isn't it ironic? So you have Muslim that are retard who will quote a Trinitarian who brings objections against another model because he prefers his own model, but he forgets to tell you these are all critiques from Trinitarians who believe the Trinity and love the Trinity and believe that the Bible reveals the Trinity. Isn't that ironic? So he's going to quote the arguments of someone who holds to, like, say, the monarchy of the Father to critique social Trinitarianism, but he forgets to tell you the person he's quoting has no doubt the Trinity is God. See the dishonesty? One second. See the dishonesty? One second. Keep praying for my cat to get better, so not have to take her to the doctor. She's walking and eating, and she's resting. So th glory to God, it's not that bad. So we got it, right? Now, let me give you the biblical basis for her experience, and we're going to go into intercession of the saints. All of these principles and rules were necessary, and I felt I needed to share them with you. I've been trying to share them with you, but Satan got in the way. May God save us from satanic attacks. So I hope you go back, rewatch this session until all these principles and rules become etched in your hearts and minds. You understand them and act upon them. Okay. These will help you in your journey. These will help you in your journey. Harry, I'll help me to help you. Just listen, my sister. I'm from the tribe that hates your tribe, Yehuda. My tribe hates your tribe and my tribe conquers your tribe because your tribe are a bunch of punks. Okay. Everyone got it? Because now let me give you the biblical basis for a story. You remember what she said? She had a life re review and there wasn't much to see because she's a good kid. That confirms what I said yesterday. I gave you verses showing that God looks upon children who are not cognizant, meaning they're not fully aware of their existence or they're not fully aware that God exists and he has a law, that God views them with compassion, mercy, and grace, and love, and has pity on them. I confirmed that yesterday. So listen to yesterday. I gave you the verses. That's why she said I was young. I didn't know any better. But remember what she said. Now let me give you the biblical basis for experience. That's how I know she saw the true God, because the Bible confirms her experience. Her experience doesn't confirm the Bible. The Bible confirms her experience. She said that Jesus had been with her, even when she used to pray as a kid, Jesus was there sitting next to her, hearing her prayer. And since her <clears throat> formation in the womb, from her mother's womb, Jesus was there. Okay, Jeremiah 1, verses 4 to 5. If brother, brother Protestant is here, he can post for us. Jeremiah 1, 4 to 5. Watch here. Let me give you the biblical basis that her experience is genuine, it's real, it's from the true God. Did he leave? Let me know. Okay. Guys here, Ortho Christos, pay attention. Who came to who and who spoke to who? Listen to this, fool, and everyone watch. Then the word of the Lord. Kyrios, I'm sorry. Logos to Kyriou in the Greek. The Logos of Jehovah, the Lord, came to me saying, the word appeared to me, Jeremiah, and the word said to me, and what did the word say to him? Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. There you go. The word is coming to Jeremiah to commission Jeremiah and reminding Jeremiah, I, the word, formed you in the womb, and I already knew you and chose you. Before you were born, I sanctified you. I ordained you a prophet to the nations. Who is the word? The word that became flesh. Who appeared to Jeremiah? The word, Jesus, before he became flesh. Who formed Jeremiah in the womb? The word, who is Jesus. That's John 1, 3. All things came into existence through him, because without him, nothing came into existence that came into existence. And what did she say? He was with me from the time of my mother's womb. There you go. Now, let me prove to you that this word is Jesus appearing before he became flesh. As a living, divine person sent by the Father, who often appeared in the Old Testament visibly. Now let's read Jeremiah 1, 6 to 10. Watch here, guys. I hope this is benefiting you and you're enjoying this and learning. I don't know if you are. Then pray for me to recover from my cheat day. Boy. Then said I, Ah, Adonai Yehovah, Lord Jehovah. Behold, 
I cannot speak for I am a youth. But Jehovah said to me, now notice the word who speaks is Jehovah who speaks. Do not say I am a youth, for you shall go to all to whom I shall send you. And whatever I command you, you shall speak. Sounds like the Great Commission. When Jesus said to disciples, go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them into the name of the Father and of the Son of the Holy Spirit, teaching them all that I've commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the world, the end of the age. Now watch here, verse 8. Do not be afraid of their faces, for I am with you to deliver you, says Jehovah. Now watch here, the word who is Jehovah appearing visibly. Watch here, verse 9. Then Jehovah put forth his hand. So Jeremiah is seeing a divine figure in human shape, in human form, extending a human hand that he physically feels touching him. Then Jehovah put forth his hand and touched my mouth. And Jehovah, the Lord said to me, behold, I put my words in your mouth. See, I have this day set you over the nations and over the kingdoms to root out, to pull down, to destroy, and to throw down, to build, and to plant. Ariel, sister, one more time. Help me to help you stop posting verses. Just pay attention, sister. You keep doing this, and I don't want to block you. You're not paying attention to anything I'm saying. You're more about your agenda. You're wasting my time, so I'm going to have to block you if you're not listening. Everyone got it? You see, this is Jesus in his preeminent existence as the word who said, I formed you in the womb, and I've been with you. You guys caught that? And what did she say? Jesus was the one who's with me from my mother's womb. All right. Then she said, she saw God the Father as living light, pure light. And his light just filled the entire horizon. And he's pure love. All right. Psalm 104, verse 2. Psalm 104, verse 2. Let's see if the Bible confirms her experience. Psalm 104, verse 2. Who cover yourself with light as with a garment, who stretch out the heavens like a curtain. So you, Jehovah, wear light as clothing. Your clothing is light. Your garment is light. Take it easy, for Armor Apologetics. Give her a chance. So God the Father appeared as pure living light and pure love. All right. Well, Jehovah is light. He dresses in light. His clothing is light. His garment is light. And what did Paul see? Acts 9, verses 1 and 9, on the road to persecuted Christians in Damascus, Syria, Damascus, Syria, light shined at noon when the sun is brightest, and this light knocked him down and blinded him, and in the light was Jesus saying, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Who are you, Lord? I am Jesus whom you're persecuting. And the light that Jesus shined revealed that he dwells in blinded Saul until An Annas reached him three days later and laid hands on him and prayed and scales fell off his eyes and he started to see. Now let's go to 1 John 1, 5 to 7. God the Father appeared as a being of light who is pure love and she sat on his lap. 1 John 1, 5 to 7. Here's the biblical basis. Okay. And then we can go into... Intercession. This is the message which we have heard from him and declare to you that God is light. Now, which person of the Godhead is it referring to here? See if you can figure it out. In him is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he, God, is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus Christ, his Son cleanses us from all sin. So here, when John says God is light and there's no darkness in him, and if we belong to him, we will also walk in his light and not be dark. Who is this God that he's referring to? The Father of Jesus Christ. Because it says the blood of his Son, God's Son, who is the light, his Son's blood cleanses us from all sin. And what about God being pure love? 1 John 4, 8. And she goes, God being a man. Well, we know Jesus is a man. He's a man in heaven and will return to the earth as a man to judge the living and the dead. 1 John 4, 8. 
He who does not love does not know God, for God is love. Now, is Jesus still a man who is God? And will Jesus return to the earth as a man? Because he's still a man. He'll never stop being a man. And that he's God? Yeah. Acts 17, 30, 31. So she saw the Bible unfold before her eyes, lived out before her eyes, and she didn't even know a word of the Bible at the age of 16 because her Jewish atheist father told her Christianity is a hoax. Acts 17, 30 to 31. Truly, these times of ignorance God overlooked, but now commands all men everywhere to repent because he has appointed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness by the man whom he is ordained. He has given assurance of this to all by raising him from the dead. So this man has been raised from the dead, and this man is coming to the earth to judge it. So Jesus is still a man who will return to the earth as a man with a glorified body to judge the world as a man. But is he God who is a man? All right, let's go to 1 Timothy 2.5. 1 Timothy 2.5. And Titus 2.13-14. And then we go into intercession. 1 Timothy 2.5. And then Titus 2, 13 to 14. For there is one God. Notice, not was. There is right now. Right now as I write to you. And I'm writing to you in the 60s, 30 years after Jesus' resurrection. Right now there is one God and one meter between God and men. The man Christ Jesus. So right now as I write to you, 30 years after Jesus' resurrection, we have a mediator in heaven. And that meteor is the man the human Jesus Christ. And because he's a man, he's one of us, represents us before the Father. But what else is he, Paul? Titus 2, 13 and 14. Looking for the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God. Not just God. He's our great God and Savior Jesus Christ. So the man Jesus is our gloriously great God and Savior who is coming. And that's our hope. He'll come as a man who is our great God in the flesh to save us and judge the wicked. And this glorious great God of ours, who is our Savior, the man Christ, gave himself for us that he might redeem us from every lawless deed and purify for himself his own special people, zealous for good works. There you go. Everything she saw, biblical. Everything she saw, confirmed by the Bible. So I know she saw the real God because the Bible confirms it. Others may see Satan or demons deceiving them, but she saw God because the Bible confirmed their experience. That's it. There you go. But what was the point of to take away? Remember what she said? I don't know how God can be a man. I don't know how God can be light. I don't know how God can be love. I don't know how. But that's what I experienced. Exactly. The New Testament writers. The apostles and their followers experience this living, infinite, ultimate reality called the Trinity. They saw Jesus, God in the flesh. Saw God the Father appear in a cloud. Heard his voice audibly. Saw the Holy Spirit appear visibly, either as a dove or as tongues of fire. Heard him audibly. Experienced God dynamically, supernaturally. And even after Jesus' ascension, seeing Jesus in dreams and visions. They experienced the Trinity. And they recorded that experience by inspiration, to be preserved as a witness to who that God is. But they didn't bother explaining how. <clears throat> they didn't say, well, here's how the Trinity can be sensible to us. There's one infinite substance, a soul, that's so richly endowed with three centers of rational faculties sufficient for personhood. That's the language of William Lane Craig. Exactly, Ortho Christos. Let me repeat what you said. They had no need to exegete what they experienced. They lived it. Yeah. I'd rather live in the Trinity, live the Trinity, see the Trinity, experience the Trinity, and be flooded in the presence of the Trinity than sit down and philosophize about it. We who philosophize about the Trinity, we are a pathetic group. Because we're philosophizing about something we haven't truly experienced. Whereas the writers in the New Testament, the apostles and their followers, experienced this reality and were flooded and full 
with the presence of that ultimate reality called the Trinity. We're the jackasses, the dumbasses, the brain asses saying, oh, yes, uh, social Trinitarianism. You know why? Because the Trinity is very social. <laughs> get it? <laughs> so, so, you didn't get it? All right. Well, no, Latin Trinitarianism, because Latin is a sacred language. Okay. All right. Yeah, yeah. So you get the point? Keep that in mind. Keep that in mind. The models are not as important as the biblical data. And the fact is you're dealing with an ultimate reality that is infinite. And no one model will best capture this infinite reality. <clears throat> so keep that in mind. And keep that in mind when heretics like Muslim and a retard and Dale, I want to be a girl, Tuggy, try to critique all models of the Trinity because this is to get you off the trail. Because it's not so much whether you can come up with a coherent model. What's important is, can you prove it scripturally, biblically? Hold on a second. I'll call you in a few minutes because I'm on a live stream. Uh, because if God is triune... And he's the God that exists, and he's the God that made you. You better know who God is as he is. Just like if God is not a trinity and you're worshiping the trinity, you're worshiping a false God. And by your name, I can tell you are a heretic, a son of the devil who worships a false God that you think is Yahweh. If you are a heretic and a spiritual bastard, feel free to call me on Skype so we can debate and show you why your God is fake and the triune God lives. Everyone got that now so we can go into intersection? Huper usin. Yep, huper usin. I was trying to read the Greek. Huper usin. Huper usin. Now, can we go into intercession? Guys, I'm enjoying this session. Glory to God, it went smooth. Every essential point I wanted to share to prepare you on <clears throat> how to conduct your journey if you want to find the fullness of the truth, the rules I gave, the principles, all of this was necessary, and I was trying to lay these principles down in the previous sessions. Glory to God. We got through them. May God sanctify my words, my mouth, sanctify our bodies and our minds to love Jesus and preserve these sessions and use them for his glory. Now, with that said, let's talk about intercession. Okay, man. Okay. What's up, Rachel? What's up, Rachel? What's up, Dave Kendall? By the way, Brother Robert Jensen, the other day, you said something, and I responded, so I wanted to clarify. Oh, okay. Sorry, brother. Yahweh's a leer. Sorry, man. Oh, you're upset? Yahweh's a leer that I'm rude? Did I hurt your feelings, buttercup? Did I hurt you? If you're a Trinitarian, then why would you ask me, why is the Trinity so important? Buttercup? Come on. Buttercup, I love you. Don't be offended. Forgive me, sweetie. Sweetie. All right. Robert Jensen, the other day when I shut down because of uh, Charbel, you said something, and I wanted to clarify it. Are you there, Robert? You said, well, Jesus forgave Peter, and I said, and Paul condemned Peter. Do you remember that? In response to what you said. Jesus forgave Peter, and I came back saying Paul condemned Peter. Because what I wanted to say, but it was the end of the stream, is yes, Jesus did forgive Peter. But Paul, speaking by that same Jesus, please, I got to kill this guy. Come here! You got to die, sucker. That was that, what do you call it? Sorry, man. I've been after this mosquito for a month. It's been sucking the life out of me. All right? And I came close to killing it. For the month, I haven't been able to kill this darn mosquito. It's been sucking the life out of me, man. Got no more blood. Darn it. Okay, now. Okay, sorry, sister. Oh, so you are a buttercup, sister, if you're nice. And if you look like Monica Kardashian, maybe I'll end up marrying you. But you got to look like Monica Kardashian. Sorry, sister, I didn't mean to be rude. I didn't know what you're on about because even your name kind of threw me off. I thought you're one of these Hebrew Israelite or Hebrew roots movement only. Sorry, she is a buttercup, guy. She's a sister. 
sorry, forgive me, sister. Forgive me and ask the Lord to help me to be more patient. So I hope I'm forgiven. Anyway, what I was trying to say, Robert Jensen, is the same Jesus then <clears throat> rebuked and condemned Peter later on through Paul because Paul says, it's Jesus who's speaking in and through me. So there you go. Now let's go into intercession. Are we ready? Buttercup. No, that's a fly, Ortho Christos. Get your facts straight, mister. Get your facts straight, sir. Am I too aggressive? Do you want me to be an alpha male or a beta male, Yahweh? Ayler? Do you want me to be Samantha instead of Tammy? I'll wear a dress as long as it's not a bikini. Because I won't look good in a bikini, girlfriend. I still got love handles. No matter how much weight I lose, they don't, don't disappear. So I can't wear a bikini, girlfriend. No bikini. I'll wear a dress. And I like only French and pink. I don't like colored nail polish. So if you're going to make me put some nail polish on, come on, girlfriend. I'll be Samantha Ayler. Hi, Mrs. Samantha Ayler to you. Yeah. So you understand that, Robert Jensen's? Because Paul says in 2 Corinthians 13, verse 3 and verse 10, it is Jesus speaking in and through him and giving him the authority to exhort, command, and rebuke. Am I such a chad? Wow, am I such a chad? Why are you so like this? Oh, you brood. Ew, ew. All right. Sorry, sister. I try not to offend sisters unless they are butches. Okay? It doesn't help. I was married to Mike Tyson's, what they call it? What's that word? Doppel ganger? Is that it? I was married to Mike Tyson's doppelganger. Is that the word? Am I missing that word? You know where there's a word where someone that looks exactly like you. Okay, here go. Here's the paper. I'm ready if you are. Oh, doppelganger. Yeah, I, you know, I was married to Mike Tyson doppelganger, boy. I couldn't last more than one round. When Mike got upset, she knocked the daylight out of me. Ding. Hey, yo, I didn't hear the bell. One more round. Get up, you son of a fish. Because Mickey loves you. Son of a fish. You mother Parker. I should have been. I swear I should have been in Hollywood, dude. Wrong, wrong, wrong line of work. Right? Long, long wine of wick. Wrong line of work. I should have been in, you know, Hollywood. Hey, yo. Yo, Mike. Yo, I didn't hear the bell. One more round. One more round. Get up, you son of a fish. Make it love there. Mother Parker. Yeah. Are we ready? No, it's my cheat day, James. And because I have so much calories I need to burn, I got too much energy. You want me to do Halal Hogan? <clears throat> Hold on. Me, 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 me. <clears throat> no, I can't do it right now. I got to let my throat warm up. Figaro, Figaro, Figaro. Yo, Adrian! Adrian! Yo, Adrian! Shut up, you son of a fish! By the way, if you're wondering what I'm referring to, I'm referring to, was it Rocky V? Rocky V, where he fights Tommy. Tommy in the street. You know, when he gets beat, and then he sees a flashback. Mickey, fight this guy, ha, ha. See, I'm, see, I'm getting hiccups now. Fight this guy, ha, rock. Mm. Guys, I got to do intercession of the saints. Come on, man. Woo. Hold on. Fight this guy, ha, rock. Get up, you son of a fish. Mickey loves you. Now I got hiccups. Did you know Burgess Meredith, who played Mickey, also played Penguin and Batman? Right? He also played Penguin and Batman in the 60s Batman with Adam West. So that's where I remembered Burgess Meredith. Get up, you son of a fish. Mickey loves you. Fight this guy hard. And I remember the scene in Rocky II where Rocky does the sign of the cross, right? Ravi, can your mother be serious and stop doing muta with the Shia for once in her life? Ravi, that dirty dog on her. Uh, it, when when Rocky and Rocky II did the sign of the cross, he goes, I get noivous every time he does that. I get noivous. You know why? Son of a fish, because I'm Jewish. All right, anyway. Are we ready now? Sergeant Grinch, 
You're a mean one, Mr. Grinch. All right, here you go. Jordan, you must love me, sir. In Jesus' name, now, after that two-hour intense discussion on these necessary foundational principles and rules, now we go into the session of saints. Yeah, he was. Burgess Meredith was a Jew. No, really. He was a Jewish actor. <laughs> Sorry. That's why in Rocky Three, when his character, Mickey, dies, it's a Jewish ceremony. Go watch Rocky Three. See what you guys did? With all the screaming, I got hiccups. There's the article. This article I wrote in order to silence the Protestant butchering of 1 Timothy 2.5. Oh, boy. Can someone scare me? Maybe I can stop the hiccups. Anyway, if you go to the end of the article, there is another post that goes with this. There are se several. In the bottom of that article, further reading, the relationship between belief and water baptism. This too will help you. These two articles will help you, guys. All right? Now I'm going to explain to you how they're going to help you. Right? I'm going to explain how they're going to help you. So go there, and I just gave you the link. But in the first article... Not only do I give you links to this other post, Relationship Between Belief Water Baptism, I link to three other important discussions of 1 Timothy 2.5. You have permission to take all my articles, all my rebuttals, my sessions, upload them, clip them, translate them, study them, use them in your Bible studies. It's for you. I'm doing this for you. You don't need to ask, ask me, Sam, can we use our stuff? Why do you think I wrote it? So you can use it. Now, hopefully, I'll stop with the hiccups. <clears throat> now, what are we going to establish here? I'm going to establish two important facts. Number one, 1 Timothy 2.5, in its context, is not negating God accepting and permitting intercession, mediation done by believers in Christ members of the body of Christ, in actuality, it presupposes it. So let me repeat. Number one, 1 Timothy 2.5, in its context, and in the over context of Scripture, is not negate, negating, see, these hiccups, oh my goodness. <clears throat> it's not undermining, it's not refuting or condemning the intercession and mediation of others who are united to Christ, one with Christ in the spirit, who are members of a spiritual body. It's actually the opposite. And number two, I'm going to show you examples. Okay? I'm going to show you examples from the New Testament where Jesus healed, blessed, saved, and forgave and delivered people due to the intercession of others. Do you understand what I'm going to establish? I like what Ulka said. Ulka thought you're going to get, get away with this, huh, Ulka? I said, hey, man, can someone scare me? Because they say a good way to cure hiccups is someone scare you. She goes, look in the mirror. So here's a sister. I think it's a sister. Hey. Yes, I do, Harriel. Hey, uh, you want to stop hiccups? You want to get scared? Look in the mirror and freak yourself out. Good one, Olka. You thought I wasn't going to catch that comment. La, 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 la. I got you, Olka, Olka, Olka. Everybody knows it's Olka, it's Olka, it's Olka. Fun for a girl and a boy. All right. Okay, you want me to throw some cold water? Here you go. Hold on. Are we ready now to go into the meat? You understand what the two facts I'm going to establish right now? And here's the article. Shut up with the hiccups, man. Shut up, Sammy. <laughs> All right. Fact number one, 1 Timothy 2.5, in its context, does not negate, condemn, refute, undermine that God accepts, exhorts, expects believers united to Christ, born of the spirit, members of a spiritual body to intercede and mediate before the one mediator for the salvation of others. It actually presupposes it. Number two, 
I'm going to show you cases in the ministry of the historical Jesus where Jesus forgave, saved, delivered, blessed individuals due to the intercession of others. So are you ready to embark on this journey with me? All right. Are you ready? Let me see something. All right. I gave you the link. Okay. Let me charge. Hold on, guys. Let me throw some cold water at me. I wanted to see if you see it. Okay, no, Ulka, no. you're silent now, Ulka. What happened, Ulka? Ah, huh? what happened, Ulka? <laughs> Ulka, what happened, Ulka? Ulka, you're running away. Hold on, let me go to my dirty sink. So what happens when you're single, nobody mingle. You can just leave the dishes for weeks. And who's going to hold you accountable, huh? You tell me, man. Who? Who's going to nag you? Hey, you. You, you, my bold husband, move it before it's going to be round three with Mike Tyson, eh? Hola. There you go. Here you go. Here, cold water, huh? Cold water. Yeah. <laughs> huh? What happened here? What happened here, man? Why like this? Hold on. Let me see something. Let's see. These are classic tees. They say it's tight here, but loose here. So is it? Let's see. I got to get the gym, man. No gym. Don't worry. It's coming. It's coming. Yeah, Olka. <clears throat> Ruski, baby. Ruski. <laughs> Ruski, man. More clips from my enemies say, see, he's demonized. He's demonized. But hold on, Jamal Muhammad White. Wasn't this causally determined for me to be demonized, according to you, sir? All things are determined by you, right? I mean, I'm sorry, not you. You foolish too by what you believe in. Causally determined. Now it's causally determined manifest. Okay, let's begin. Why are you laughing, Michael Waller? Isn't that what fat boy Antonia Dodgers believes? And doesn't Jamal Muhammad White believe? Everything was causally determined. So I'm causally determined to be a nutcase. Causally determined to manifest. Causally determined to go on a rant and cuss people out. And that's why nobody likes me, because it was determined for me. <laughs> All right. Let's begin. If you go to my post, I give you a series of examples from Scripture. This will help you establish communion of saints, right? This will help you. Oh, you're Polsky? Are you female or male? Ulka, you're very yucky, Ulki. All right. Anyway, this will help you establish communion of saints does not violate scripture. So let's begin. 1 Timothy 2, verses 1 to 7. 1 Timothy 2, verses 1 to 7. <clears throat> now, in this article, what version did I use? Oh, New King James Version. I believe I used the New King James Version. Did I? Uh, yes, that's what I use. All right, let's begin. <clears throat> Therefore, I exhort, first of all, that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men, kings and all who are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and reverence. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who desires all men to be saved and to, to come to the knowledge of the truth. For there is one God... And one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time. Now, here's what's ironic. The very context of this passage that says there's one mediator is the very context that says God <clears throat> expects all believers to make intercession. Notice how it begins. Guys, do not ever allow anyone to take verses out of context and make sure you read the context. Because now go back to verse 1. Look what it says. Therefore I exhort, I'm exhorting you to do what? Supplicate. Pray, intercede. And give thanks to God that wants all men to be saved. Because if God didn't want all men to be saved, then it would be useless to pray to God to save all men. So what Paul is saying is, be thankful and praise God that he's a God of love who desires salvation of all humans. 
And because you know God desires the salvation of all humans, then you can pray and ask and intercede for the salvation of all humans, no matter their status and position. You know God wants the emperors to be saved. Pray for them. You know God wants <clears throat> slaves to be saved. Pray for them. You know God wants females and males to be saved. Pray for them. That means God wants your family members to, to be saved. Pray for them. Supplicate for them. Intercede for them. And you know your prayers and your supplication will be accepted because your God wants all men to be saved and to come to know the truth of the gospel because Christ offered himself as a ransom for the salvation of everyone. And because Christ is mediating, he will make your prayers efficacious and acceptable. That's the context of the passage. You see it? When it says one mediator, it's not to discourage you. It's actually the opposite. It's encouraging you. You have one mediator that guarantees and ensures your prayers, though imperfect, and you are imperfect and sinful, will be fully acceptable because he makes your prayers acceptable when you offer it in union with him. It's actually encouraging you to pray, intercede, and mediate. And yet Protestants, like I used to be, distort this to teach the opposite. Isn't that shameful? And yet the Catholics and Orthodox, for the most part, because they don't know Scripture, let them get away with misquoting 1 Timothy 2.5 because they ignore verses 1 to 4. Are you seeing the real meaning now? Thank God for all men because God wants all men to be saved. So supplicate, intercede, knowing if God wants all men to be saved, that means he even wants the pagan emperors to be saved. Who at that time would have been Emperor Nero who burned Christians alive, right? Set a fire and blamed it on the Christians and was insane and committed suicide. God even wants that nut case to be saved, right? So thank him. Thank you, God, that you want all men to be saved. And now that I know your heart is for all humans, I now have the confidence to pray for all humans because it's your desire for all humans to be saved. And it's your desire to work through our prayers as we pray and you'll act upon our prayers to save people. And now we have the assurance because we have one mediator. That mediator will make our prayers acceptable to you because he offered himself as a ransom to procure the redemption of everyone. That's the meaning. You see it now in that light? And if you think I'm lying, here, 1 Timothy 2, 3 to 4. It says it right there. So this is one of the most abused passages by Protestants. And sadly, I used to abuse it until the Spirit opened my mind, honestly, to see it for what it's saying. Here, why do you think the word for is there? Because Paul is now explaining verses 1 to 2. He's explaining why should you intercede, supplicate, pray, and thank God for all men, even those in authority that we may live peaceably? Because this is good and acceptable in sight of God our Savior. Well, Paul, why is it good and acceptable that we do it? Because he desires all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. Oh, that's why it pleases God and it's acceptable to him that we pray for all men and supplicate and intercede and thank him because he wants all men to be saved because that delights its heart. It delights God's heart. That's what God wants and that pleases God and he accepts those prayers from you. For he is the one God of all men. There is no other God that any man can turn to. There's only one God that can save anyone. So all men need that God. And that God has made salvation available for all men that he's created because he sent Christ to offer ransom for all of them. Everyone got it? So look what Phantom said. I was Catholic and became Protestant because I saw this issue a problem. But now in maturity, context is making sense a lot of the older church. You better believe it, Phantom. Been there, done that. So do we understand now what 1 Timothy 2 means and doesn't mean? Okay. Now let me give you examples. Jesus saves people, forgives people, heals people, blesses people. Due to the intercession of others. 
And I have too many examples to list. I don't think Protestant will be able to post all of them. God bless him for working. He doesn't get paid. He does this as an act of love. But anyway, it's all in the article. I'll read them for you. It's from the New King James Version. <clears throat> okay. Pray the Lord will be glorified. We are content. Pray more people come who are quality people want to learn, not pontificate. Let's go. First example is actually several examples in one because it's basically the same. Notice how people bring others to the Lord and beseech the Lord for these others. This is the principle I'm establishing. What am I establishing? That in Scripture, you'll find people bringing others to the Lord, beseeching the Lord, interceding for them, and the Lord doing what is asked. Here it is, Mark 1, 32, 34. Are we ready? Mark 1, 32 to 34. You guys ready? Let's read. At evening, when the sun had set, they brought to him all who were sick and those who were demon-possessed. They brought to him. That's intercession. They brought the sick, demon-possessed. Others brought them to Jesus. And the whole city was gathered together at the door. Then he healed many who were sick with various diseases, cast out many demons, and he did not allow the demons to speak because they knew him. They, they knew him. He silenced the demons for making his identity known. Are you catching it? People brought the sick and demon possessed to Christ. That's what an intercessor does. He brings you to Christ and goes before you in front of Christ and asks Christ to do something for you. We catch that first example? Because I got a lot more. Okay? Mark 6, 53 to 56. Mark 6, 53 to 56. When they had crossed over, they came to the land of Gennesaret and anchored there. <clears throat> and when they came out of the boat, immediately the people recognized them, ran through that whole surrounding region, and began to carry about on beds those who were sick to wherever, to wherever they heard he was. Wherever he entered into villages, cities, or the country, they laid the sick in the marketplaces and begged him that they might touch the hem of his ar ar uh, garment. Holy Spirit, save me from stammering. Make it clear to my tongue and to the people who are hearing. In Jesus' name. And as many as touched him were made well. There it is again, that principle. I bring someone to Jesus who is sick, demon-possessed, and I beseech Jesus to heal that person, and he does. That's the principle. Mark 8, 22 to 26. Then he came to Bethsaida, Mark 8, 22 to 26. Then he they came to him. He came to Bethsaida, and they came, brought a blind man to him, and begged him to touch him. Lord, we beg you, touch him. So he took the blind man by the hand and led him out of the town. And when he had spit on his eyes and put his hands on him, he asked him if he saw anything. And he looked up and said, I see men like trees walking. Then he put his hands on his eyes again and made him look up. And he was restored and saw everyone clearly. Then he sent him away to his house saying, neither go into the town nor tell anyone in the town. Matthew 15, 29 to 31. Matthew 15, 29 to 31. Watch the principle here. <clears throat> Jesus departed from there, skirted the Sea of Galilee, and went up on the mountain and sat down there. Then great multitudes came to him, having with them the lame, blind, mute, maimed, and many others. And they laid them down at Jesus' feet, and he healed them. So the multitude marveled when they saw the mute speaking, the maimed made whole, the lame walking, and the blind seeing. And they glorified the God of Israel. Are you seeing this principle in action? Guys, are you seeing this principle in action? What's the principle? People interceding for others, mediating for others, going before Jesus on behalf of others, and asking Jesus to do something for others, and Jesus doing it. That's intercession. That's mediation. That's communion of the saints. Are you catching it? I got more, so just bear with me. Let's make it a good-sized crowd. Glory to God. Let us be content. And more learn these facts and use them. 
<clears throat> and get entertained in the process and educated and convicted and follow the Lord. Mark 7, 31 and 37. Mark 7, 31 and 37. I'll try to finish my article here so I don't have to do a part two. I'll retitle it and do Jewish scribe Joe's witnesses later. Okay. Mark 7, 31, 37. Again, departing from the region of Tyre and Sidon, he came through the midst of the region of Decapolis to the Sea of Galilee. Then they brought to him one who was deaf and had an impediment in his speech. They begged him to put his hand on him. You catching it? They're doing it for this man. He can't do it for himself. They're bringing him, pleading with Jesus for him. That's intercession. <clears throat> and he took him aside from the multitude and put his fingers in his ears. And he spat and touched his tongue. Then looking up to heaven, he sighed and said to him, Ephatha, which is Aramaic. That is, be open. Immediately his ears were open and the impediment of his tongue was loose. May the same Lord Jesus loosen my tongue to only speak his words perfectly and clearly and empowers by his spirit to love him and obey his word and know his word. And he spoke plainly. Then he commanded them that they should tell no one. <clears throat> but the more he commanded them, the more widely they proclaimed it. And they were astonished beyond measure, saying, He has done all things well. He makes both the deaf to hear <clears throat> and the mute to speak. See how Satan's trying to attack me by my help. And in Jesus' name, the Holy Spirit, give me the health and vigor and control to use my health to glorify the Lord. All right. <clears throat> all of these I classified under the same example because they're all the same. People bringing sick people, demonized people to Christ. Second example. Watch this. This has to do with salvation. Second example. Okay. And again, he entered Capernaum, Capernaum. After some days, Mark 2, verses 1 to 5. And it was heard that he was in the house. Mark 2, verses 1 to 5. Immediately, many gathered together so that there was no longer room to receive them, not even near the door. And he preached the word to them. Then they came to him, bringing a paralytic who was carried by four men. And when they could not come near him because of the crowd, they uncovered the roof where he was. So when they had broken through... They let down the bed on which the paralytic was lying when Jesus saw their faith. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, son, your sins are forgiven you. Right there, burial to the Protestant objection against intercession of the saints. Jesus saw the faith of the men, these four, that they loved their friends so much and knew Jesus had the power to heal him, <clears throat> that nothing would stop them from bringing their friend to him to the point that they even tore someone's roof just to get him to Jesus. When he saw what faith they had, that nothing would stop them, Jesus forgave the man his sins. These are the kind of friends you want. These are the kind of friends you need that will do everything in their power and will not allow anything to stop them to bring you to Jesus. They will move mountains to bring you to Jesus. <clears throat> you see that? Are we getting it? All right. Let's go to the other examples. <clears throat> In no particular order, right? No. A lot of these have to do with healings, but in no particular order. <clears throat> I'm going to read all of them. Sorry, my voice. Luke 7, 1 to 10. This one I love. This one I love. Luke 7, 1 to 10. This one I love. Pay attention. How many people are involved in this miracle? Luke 7, 1 to 10. Now, when he concluded all his sayings in the hearing of the people, he entered Capernaum, and a certain centurion servant who was dear to him was sick and ready to die. Now, let me explain the significance of this. A centurion is a Roman soldier who commands 100 soldiers, and Rome was considered the enemy of Israel, and the Jews hate the Romans and hated <clears throat> the soldiers. In Jesus' name, the Holy Spirit fill me with health in my lungs and my chest and throat. 
rebuking Satan. So Satan will not prevent me to finish this for the glory of Jesus. We will endure by the power of the Holy Spirit because Satan wants to stop us. May the Lord crush his head and rebuke him in the name of Jesus our Lord. Now, centurions were hated by the Jews, but this centurion was exceptional because he loved the Jews and became convinced their God was the true God. So now watch. So when he heard about Jesus, he sent elders of the Jews to him. Now notice, he's not going to Jesus directly. Protestants, he thinks he's unworthy to go to Jesus. Protestants. So he sends elders of the Jews to intercede for him, to put in a good war, word, to move Jesus, to show him favor. He sent elders of the Jews to him, pleading with him to come and heal his servant. Catching it? See what's happening here? All right. Now watch. And when they came to Jesus, they begged him. That's intercession. Jamal Muhammad White. Others go before Jesus, begging him to show favor to someone who doesn't think he's good enough to approach Christ directly. Hmm. Begged him earnestly, saying that the one for whom he should do this was deserving, for he loves our nation and has built us a synagogue. Then Jesus went with them, so he accepted their intercession. You catching this, guys? When's the last time you're going to have Protestants exit Jesus' passages as support of communion of saints? You won't. Then Jesus went with them, and when he was already not far from the house, now watch this. The centurion sent friends to him. Not only did he send the Jews to bring him, when he was near the house, he sent his friends, go to him before he reaches my house saying to him, Lord, do not trouble yourself, for I'm not worthy that you should enter my roof. Therefore, I did not even think myself worthy to come to you. Did you catch it? Why? Because according, according to Jewish custom, Jews entering the home of a Gentile would make them ceremonially unclean. Because to eat the food of Gentiles or to come into contact with Gentiles may defile you ceremonially because of the unclean foods they'd eat or unclean practices, okay? So the centurion, knowing Jewish custom, saying, I am not worthy for you to enter my house. You're too good to even enter my house. So you don't need to. Look at his faith. Therefore, I did not even think myself worthy to come to you, but say the word and my servant will be healed. For I also am a man placed under authority, having soldiers under me. And I say to the, to the one, go, and he goes. And to another, come, and he comes. And to my servant, do this, and he does it. When Jesus heard these things, he marveled at him and turned around and said to the crowd that followed him, I say to you, I have not found such great faith, not even in Israel. He puts you Israelites to shame, this Gentile that you think is unclean. And those who were sent, returning to the house, found the servant, well, who had been sick. Now let's unpack this meat, shall we? Are you guys ready? Notice how many groups were involved. The centurion intercedes for his servant. The friends of the centurion intercede for the centurion. The Jews, who are the elders, intercede for the centurion. So you have Jews and the friends of the centurion interceding for the centurion as he intercedes for the servant. You see how many groups are involved in this intercession? Are you catching it? Before I move on. So Jesus heals a centurion. Because, I'm sorry. Jesus heals... Lord, have mercy on me. May the Father, Son, Holy Spirit perfect my tongue to speak perfectly, accurately, without error, perfectly recalling Scripture, and save us from all sin, to hate sin, and love righteousness. Father, Son, Holy Spirit, in Jesus' name. Okay. <clears throat> the servant is healed because of the intercession of the centurion. 
Jesus heals the servant because of the centurion's friends and the Jewish elders who interceded for the centurion, who interceded for his servant. You got it? Before I move on? Sinking in how it's working here? All right, let's continue. Eighth example, which I'll leave for the for the end. I'll say the best for last. Let me see, because they're all similar, <clears throat> similar in, in theme. John 4, 43 to 54. Jesus healing, forgiving, saving, blessing because of the intercession of others. John 4, 43, 54. <clears throat> Now, after the two days, he departed from there and went to Galilee, for Jesus himself testified that a prophet has no honor in his own country. So when he came to Galilee, the Galileans received him, having seen all the things he did in Jerusalem at the feast, for they also had gone to the feast. So Jesus came again to Cana of Galilee, where he had made the water wine. And there was a certain nobleman whose son was sick at Capernaum, when he heard that Jesus had come out of Judea into Galilee, he went to him and implored him to come down and heal his son, for he was at the point of death. Notice, he's got to come down, so he's got to travel. There are no cars, no Ubers, no taxis, no planes. Then Jesus said to him, unless you people see signs and wonders, you will by no means believe. The nobleman said to him, sir, come down before my child dies. Pay attention. Jesus said to him, go your way, your son lives. Now notice how long it takes the man to get back to his house. So the man believed the word. Okay, he took Jesus at his word. All right, if you say it, I'll believe it. Still having some doubts, but he still acted on that weak faith, which now is going to be made stronger. And he went his way. And as he was now going down, his servants met him and told him, saying, your son lives. Then he inquired of them the hour when he got better. And they said to him, yesterday at the seventh hour, the fever left him. So the father knew that it was at the same hour in which Jesus said to him, your son lives. And he himself believed. So that little faith he had that was weak, sufficient enough for him to act on Jesus's word, now rewarded. And now because he saw the miracle, his faith has been made stronger. And that's how our faith is. It starts weak. But then the more we encounter Jesus, the more we walk with Jesus, the more we see Jesus's presence in our life, the stronger our faith becomes to the point where we reach such a level of faith and trust that if they kill us, we won't shrink or back down. Are we getting it? So he believed and his whole household. This again is the second sign. Jesus did when he had come out of Judea into Galilee. Now, did you guys catch it? He asked of them, when was my son he healed? He goes, yesterday at the seventh hour. It took him a full day to get back home. That means his house was so far away, it took him a whole day. But now notice in these two miracles, a pattern. Jesus doesn't enter the centurion's house. And yet the servant is healed. So Jesus isn't there in the house, face to face, physically present with the servant, and yet he can heal him. Jesus is physically away from this man's son. He's so far away, it takes a day to get there. And yet from that far distance, he's able to heal him at that very moment, even though physically he's far away from where the child was. Are you seeing the pattern here? You see what's happening? I'm going to bring down the I'm going to break down the implication in a minute because I'm going to give you another example of this. Okay, the Syrophoenician woman, the Canaanite, whose daughter was demon possessed. Now watch here, another one, right? Mark 7, 24 to 30. Watch the pattern with these miracles. Mark 7, 24 to 30. From there he rose and went to the region of Tyre and Sidon. And he entered a house and wanted no one to know it, 
but he could not be hidden. For a woman whose young daughter had an unclean spirit heard about him, and she came and fell at his feet. The woman was a Greek, a Syrophoenician by birth. So she lived in Syria, Phoenicia area, which is around Lebanon. And she kept asking him to cast the demon out of her daughter. But Jesus said to her, let the ch children be filled first, for it's not good to take the children's bread and throw it to the little dogs, the puppies in the house. So you're a puppy, you're in the house, the master loves you, you belong to the master, you have a place he'll feed you, but let's feed the children of the covenant first. And she answered and said to him, yes, Lord, yet even the little dogs, the puppies, still manage under the table to eat from the children's crumbs. So they're able to sneak a breadcrumb before feeding time. So give me a breadcrumb. Then he said to her, for this saying, go your way. Now notice, he's not there physically. The demon has gone out of your daughter. And when she had come to her house, she found the demon gone out and her daughter lying in the bed. Okay, are you seeing the pattern with these three miracles? Three different miracles where Jesus heals two boys, a son, a servant, and a girl, a daughter of a Gentile, without physically being present there with the children. And in one case, he's so far away physically, it took more than a day for the father to reach his son. And yet without, there, without being there physically in the house, in front of the children, where he can see them face to face or touch them physically, he was able to cast out the demon and heal them miraculously. You know why? Because this is the God man. As man, Jesus physically, bodily, is limited to a certain space and place. But since he's still God and didn't cease to be God, as God, he oversees everything. He's controlling everything. He's sustaining everything, preserving everything in unit the Father and the Spirit. So as God, he can command the demon to leave. But as man, he is at a certain place and location. So even in the flesh, while walking the earth as a man, he still truly God, didn't cease to be God, having the fullness of deity united to his human nature. And because he's God, he's still omniscient, omnipresent, omnipotent. Are we catching this? Before I move on? And so why is Jesus casting out the demon out of the girl, healing the servant and the son? Because of the intercession of the daughter's mother, of the son's father, of the servant's master, the centurion, and the centurion's friends and the Jewish elders. See how it's working? So they're interceding before the intercessor, mediating before the one mediator. So where's the contradiction? Where is the difficulty? Where is the problem? The one mediator who intercedes is honoring the intercession and mediation of others. And if this is true of imperfect, fallible sinners on earth, imperfect, fallible sinners on earth, some of whom hadn't even been born of the Spirit yet because the Spirit had not been given. <clears throat> How much true would this be for believers born of the Spirit, united to Christ, and have left this earthly shell and are living in the presence of Christ as disembodied spirits who are now perfected and glorified and sinless? How much more effective are their prayers and intercession? You see where I'm going with this? All right, a few more examples. We're going to wrap it up. <clears throat> and I've given you all that you need, biblical ammunition. And if you read the other article and go watch my playlist, thanks to Protestant Believer, he created a playlist of all the sessions I did on intercession of the saints. You cannot be refuted biblically, exegetically. They can't refute you. Then you're going to expose their lie of sola scriptura, tota scriptura, because they don't care about the Bible. They care about their tradition and what their denomination says the Bible says and doesn't say. <clears throat> okay? So there you see, you're learning so much. You learn about principles and rules, about discovering the fullness of the truth, how to handle the fathers, 
the Trinity, its biblical basis, right? And now you learn the two-natured Christ, God in flesh, that even on earth, he was truly God, fully God, didn't cease to be God. Even on earth, he's omniscient, omnipotent, omnipresent, because physically, bodily, he's at one particular location, but because he's God, he oversees everything, sustains everything, preserves everything. So though as a man, he's here as God, he can summon demons miles away and demand people to be cured miles away because he doesn't, he doesn't have to be there physically to do so because he's God. Is all of this making sense? Are you seeing how clear, explicit the Bible is? So you Catholics, Orthodox, you need to be plunging the depth of Scripture. This is why I praise the Spirit, and I pray I'm not deceived, that the Spirit is using me, working in and through me, and bringing me to the fullness of the truth, so that I'm the instrument of the Spirit to show you how deep the Scriptures are, and all of this evidence supporting that what you've been taught is biblical and ancient. And thank the Lord that he opened my eyes and my ears to see this. And just to give you, by way of testimony, I finished this post three days ago because I watched another channel by another renegade who thinks that he is qualified to teach a Bible, butchering 1 Timothy 2.5. And I said, you know what? I'm now going to write a post where people went before Jesus, besieged Jesus, interceded with Jesus, and got results. And so I went, and then I just recalled, by the grace of God's Spirit, enabling me to recall this information, I pray I always recall Scripture perfectly, exegete it perfectly, and then live it out. And I did this. Because I started thinking, hold on, boom, this miracle, this miracle, this miracle. Well, it's because this person interceded, or begged, or besieged, and that's where this came from. Had I been a staunch Calvinist, though these passages were there, I wasn't seeing them with the clarity that I now see, glory to the Spirit, by convicting me of error and repenting because those Protestant Calvinist lenses were blinding me. But when the Spirit enabled me to see the error and be humble enough to say I'm wrong, now I will not put you in a box and demand that Scripture agrees with this tradition. I'll let you be God, and I'll accept your truth for what it says, but give me the grace to know it and accept it. Boom! Everything started falling in place. Boom, 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 Exactly. When I said Orthodox, I'm including all of you. See, here's what's the confusion. If I say Coptic, Coptics say, well, hey, we're Orthodox too. If I say Orthodox, yeah, but we Coptics as well. Guys, give me a break. When I try to say Coptic to mention you, you say, but wait, why are you distinguishing us from Orthodox? We're all Orthodox. If I say Orthodox, I don't mention Coptic. Oh, yeah, but we Coptic or me, 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 me. I love you, Rafe. Me, me, me. Amen, Nicodemus. Enlighten us, O oh God. A few more examples, and that's it. We're done. All right. A few more examples. Right. I want to give you the ones because this is all pretty much related people bringing demon possessed or the sick they're all related but here i want to give you the example with children mark 10 13 and 16 two examples and we're going to end it with one of my favorites and that's it and you got it there guys like i said i'm not lying when i tell you if you seek the face of the holy spirit first number one priority know your bible study your bible and i pray i practice what i preach and try to memorize it live it out make sure you're going to church Make sure you're taking Eucharist, and I pray I practice what I preach tomorrow, Sunday for me. And then come back, watch these sessions, rewatch them, read these articles, reread them, take them, upload them, learn them, present them accurately, and you cannot be refuted. I'm not exaggerating. You can't. What they're going to do is slander you and attack you while he's a meanie. He's rude. He's a heretic. He neglects his children, right? He's, he's nuts. He's crazy. There's no cheat. That's all they're going to say. Slandry, because they can't refute you. Okay, Mark 10, Mark 10, 13 to 16. Watch again, intercession. Then they brought little children to him that he might touch them. Wait, grown-ups brought their children to Christ, that Christ will bless them. So why can't you bring your children to Christ to be baptized or take 
Eucharist, Pado communion. But the disciples rebuked those who brought them. But when Jesus saw it, he was greatly displeased and said to them, let the little children come to me and do not forbid them. For of such is the kingdom of God. Assuredly, I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God as a little child will be not, by no means enter it. So Jesus honored people bringing children to him. The children didn't come to him. They were brought to Jesus. And then Jesus blessed them and loved them and said, be like them because the kingdom belongs to them. And he took them up in his arms, laid his hands on them and blessed them. So wait. You're telling me, Jesus says, the kingdom belongs to children. And you be, better be childlike if you want to accept the kingdom. And children were brought to Jesus by those who believe Jesus could bless them. And you're going to hinder people by bringing children to water baptism or to communion. When, if anything, they're most deserving of baptism and communion. Now, some smart aleck will say, but hold on. If children are innocent, and if they die in that state of innocence, they're under the grace and mercy and compassion of the Lord Jesus, who covers them by his blood and sealed and born of the Spirit, why baptize them? Well, very simple. Because if the Lord in his mercy will grant that child the average life expectancy, by baptizing the child, You've now placed him in union with Christ so that when he's mature enough to know that Jesus is Lord and he's responsible, he's already one with Christ and part of the church. See the blessing there? You understand the difference now? And if Paul tells grown-ups, tells grown-ups, you better discern whether you're worthy to take the Eucharist. Because if you don't, you're going to eat and drink judgment. And the Eucharist is our supernatural spiritual food and medicine. Food to nourish us spiritually, emotionally, psychologically, physical, physically, and healing for all post-baptismal sins. How much more are children who are in a state of innocence who have been baptized worthy of the flesh of Christ and the blood of Christ that they will take not so much for sin, but for supernatural, spiritual nourishment to strengthen them spiritually. See the point? How much more deserving are they? So much for these pathetic Protestant objections that I was deceived into believing. Thank you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit for setting me free. And now showing me the clarity of why the church did this in continuity with scripture. Is it making sense to all of you? I'm trying to articulate the objections so you can smash and de demolish the Protestant objections because this is the way to demolish because I used to be a Protestant. I know what to say and what not to say. And I'm helping you who've never been Protestant understand. Amen, victorious in Jesus' name. All right? Now, Luke 18, then we're going to end it with my favorite one. Luke 18, 15 to 17. <clears throat> Luke 18, 15 to 17. Then they also brought infants to him that he might touch them. I did this because Luke mentions their infants specifically. Infants, guys. The Luke inversion. Infants. But when the disciples saw it, they rebuked them. But Jesus called to them and said, let the little children come to me. Meaning infants. Infants, man. Not just toddlers. And do not forbid them. For of such is the kingdom of God. Wait. The kingdom belongs to infants, children. Surely I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God as a little child will by no means enter it. Can an infant come to Christ? No. Who brought the infant to Christ? The parents. And through their intercession, bringing their child to Christ and interceding, Lord, this is your child. We want to raise him in your ways. Bless him. Jesus will not bless them? He just told you the kingdom belongs to these infants and children. And do not hinder them being brought to me. Bring them to me. So this is a message to every one of you. Bring your children to me. Don't hinder them. Bring them. 
The kingdom is theirs. Be like them. Be a child so the kingdom can be like yours. Don't withhold them from me in baptism and Eucharist. What's wrong with you? Bring them. Are you learning the principle? Golden Harnish, if you have questions on JWs, you can call me on Skype. If not, don't waste my time. Are you catching it, guys? Am I? I'm giving you scripture, right? Is it me or is it Jesus and Mark and Luke that says, don't hinder the children, bring them to me. Don't hinder the infants, bring them to me. The kingdom is theirs. Bring them so I can bless them and love them and carry them in my arms. So why are you hindering your children coming to Jesus in baptism or Eucharist? Lord, forgive me. I didn't baptize my daughters. Can you pray? God in his mercy will preserve them in the love of Jesus until they get baptized. Because I had them when I was still in my Protestant days. Lord, save them. If I have found favor in your sight, Lord, your unworthy servant, if you are pleased with me and you love me, love my daughters and preserve them. Look what Jesus, Christus, my Lord and God said. Wow, how could not I see these? You know why you couldn't see? Because the Protestant lenses blinded you, brother. But praise the Spirit, he's setting you free and illuminating us to know the fullness of the truth. It now makes sense, doesn't it, brethren? Now, I hope all of you Orthodox, whether Oriental Orthodox, Coptic, Eastern, Russian, Catholic, whether Roman, whether Byzantine, Eastern Catholic, Assyrian churches, you're seeing the overwhelming biblical support for these doctrines. I hope I'm helping you in that area as a person who hated the Catholic Church and these ancient traditions, who staunchly Calvinists whom the Lord is saving, and now causing me to repent of my slander by now helping you and being used of the Spirit to build you up. I hope it's helping you. The biblical basis for these doctrines. The final one and my favorite one. Are you ready? The final one and my favorite one. Okay. Amen, Shivli. Aaron says, there's someone I know of that says you don't baptize children. Funny thing is, she's an adult and says she won't even get baptized because you don't need to. Yep, silly. Jamie, when I told my ex-wife I want to baptize my girls, you know what she told me? Let them decide it's their choice. See, I have no power and influence. A corrupt, filthy, wicked, whore of a judge, use of Lucifer, <clears throat> has given my, my ex-wife primary custody. And so she's even blocked them from talking to me. Only God can fight for my children. Jamie says, my children also haven't been baptized, but I'm going to be... In RCIA in January 2023, yay, and soon they will be baptized. So I need your prayers. Seek the intercession of the Blessed Mother, the saints, Jerome, my patron saint, to pray for us. Anyway, let me finish it. This is going to lead to intercession. Here it is, my favorite one. This one I love. And you guys should know where I'm going with this. John 2, verses 1 to 12. John 2, verses 1 to 12. John 2, verses 1 to 12. I've done sessions unpacking the spiritual meat of this wedding <clears throat> on my channel. On the third day, there was a wedding in Cana of Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. Now both Jesus and his disciples were invited to the wedding. And when they ran out of wine, the mother of Jesus said to him, they have no wine. Jesus said to her, woman, what does your concern have to do with me? My hour has not yet come. When I used to hate the Catholic Church, I used this to bash Marian devotion. But once the Holy Spirit set me free and opened my eyes, now that I have eyes to see and ears to hear, now I see this was not a rebuke. The Blessed Mother did not sin. And the Lord wasn't rebuking her in, in a manner to say, you're wrong for asking me. How do I know? Because if he was rebuking her and he was upset, then why does she go on to say in the next verse, his mother said to the servants, whatever he says to you, do it. With absolute confidence, she knew her son was going to hear her. Now let me show you how you bury the Protestant perversion of the scripture. If a Protestant says, see, Jesus is rebuking his mother because she spoke or asked presumptuously and therefore sinned. 
Then you say, so you're telling me that Jesus rebuked her for asking him to do something that was out of God's will, which is sin. And yet Jesus goes on and does the miracle anyway and honors her sinful request. And if Mary thought she was being rebuked and she was out of line, how did she know that he was going to do the miracle? So she tells the servants, be ready to do what he tells you. You catch it now? But when I was blind and I hated the Catholic Church, honestly, I love to use this passage because I didn't want the Catholic Church or the Orthodox Church to be true. But now I look at it. Wait. So if the Protestant is right, if Jamal Muhammad White is right, Jesus is rebuking Mary for being presumptuous to ask Jesus to act out of the will of God because his hour had not come, which would be sin. But then Jesus goes on and does the miracle anyway, which means he honors her sinful request. And yet Mary didn't take it as a rebuke because if she did, why did she say to the servants, be ready to do what he tells you? You catch it now? Does that look like Mary's in sin and Mary thought she's being rebuked when she goes on to say whatever he tells you to do and do it and Jesus goes ahead and does the miracle? Or is it Jesus's way of reminding the mother, I am here to do the Father's will. You are subject to the Father's will. I'm subject to the Father's will. I only do what he tells me to do, and he's the one who tells me when the hour of my ministry begins that will lead me to the cross and glorification. And guess what the father said? The hour has begun, son. Do the miracle and begin the hour leading to the cross. Why? Because it was her intercession that caused Jesus to do a miracle, the first of the signs beginning his miraculous ministry due to her intercession. Because let's finish it. Okay. His mother said to the servants, whatever he says to you, do it. Now there were set there six water parts of stone. I did an entire session breaking down the spiritual implication. Third day, seventh day, six. Go and watch those. According to the manner of purification of the Jews, containing 20 or 30 gallons apiece. Jesus said to them, fill the water pots with water. So Jesus goes ahead and honors the request, which is supposedly sinful. And the Lord is rebuking her. And the father honors her request by having Jesus do it. Because John 5, 19 and 30, Jesus says, I do nothing of my own initiative. I only do what I see the father doing. That means the father is telling the son, do it. Because the father is doing the miracle with the son and the spirit. Did you know that? If you read John 5, 19 and 20, John 5, 30. And if you read John 10, 37, 38. And you read John 14, 7 to 11. The Father and the Son were doing the miracles together on earth. And then if you read John 1, 32, 33, and John 14, 16 to 17, and Matthew 12, 28, the Holy Spirit was also working with the Father and Jesus, doing the miracles with the Father and Jesus. So when Jesus did the miracle, the Father was doing it with Jesus, and the Spirit was doing it. So Father, Son, Holy Spirit, all three of them, did the miracle of turning water to wine to honor Mary's request. And I gave you the verses to prove it. Why would they, if she's in sin, speaking presumptuously and she's being rebuked? It makes no sense. Okay, let's continue. And they filled them up to the brim, and he said to them, draw some out now and take it to the master of the feast. And they took it. When the master of the feast had tasted the water that was made wine and did not know where it came from, but the servants who had drawn the water knew, the master of the feast called the bridegroom. And he said to him, every man at the beginning sets out the good wine. And when the guests have well drunk, then the inferior. You've kept the good wine until now. This beginning of signs, Jesus did in Cain of Galilee and manifested his glory. And his disciples believed in him. After this, he went down to Capernaum. He, his mother, his brothers, and his disciples and they did not stay there many days. So did you understand the implication of this? Let me give you the verses again. Matthew 12, 28. Write them down. John 1, 32 to 33. John 5, 19 
to 20 and verse 30. John 5, 19 to 20 and verse 30. John 10, 37 to 38. John 14, 7 to 11. John 14, verses 16 to 17. And then add also John 8, 28 to 29. John 8, 28 to 29. And John 12, 49 to 50 with John 14, 31. All of those passages teach the Father and the Spirit in inseparable union with the Son did the miracles with the Son, in the Son, and through the Son. And the Son only does what the Father does with Him. And the Son only does and speaks what the Father tells Him to do and say. Which means when Mary asked for the miracle and Jesus did the miracle, that means the Father and the Spirit with the Son honored the Mother by doing the miracle for her, beginning Jesus' public miraculous ministry. Because of her intercession. Because of the intercession of the Blessed Mother, the miraculous ministry of Jesus began before the appointed time, which is another mystery, how your intercession can hasten and speed up God's will. Do you know that? That's in scripture. Your intercession can hasten and speed up God's will. I'm not lying. It's in scripture. 2 Peter 3, 12. In fact, is Protestant believer here? Can he post 2 Peter 3, 11 to 13? Notice verse 12. Second Peter 3, 11 to 13, verse 12. Now, if he's not there, full armor, can you do it? So we can wrap it up. Oh, okay. Oh, I'm sorry. So we can wrap it up. Anybody? If not, I got to read it. Let's see. Did he leave? Okay, I took it up. Full, are you able to do it or not, man? So we can wrap it up. You, man, dude, you suck. Not only suck because you're Armenian, you just suck, period. I can't. I'm on the phone. Why are you on the phone, loser? Man, here we go. 2 Peter 3, 11 to 13. Notice verse 12. I'm going to post it one at a time. It's talking about the end, okay? Oh, Protestant believer, can you post 2 Peter 3, 11 to 13? And pay attention to verse 12. Watch here. I thought you were gone, but I guess you're here. Therefore, since all these things will be dissolved, this earth. Now watch. This earth will be dissolved and transformed. What manner of persons ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness? So, knowing Jesus will come and destroy the evil by fire, how should you behave? Well, you got to be holy and godly. Why? Notice 12. Pay attention to 12. Looking for and hastening your living holy and pure because you look for the day where Jesus will come to destroy the wicked by fire but glorify you, and you're hastening it. The more righteous and obedient and pure you are, the faster, the speedier the day of Christ's return. You hasten it. You speed it up. The coming of the day of God, because of which the heavens will be dissolved, being on fire, and the elements will melt with fervor, fervent heat. All right. Give me your location. I'll be more than happy to come. And then if you have, do jihad, so I can send you to Muhammad, who's in hell. Please. Don't be a man in the comment section. Send it to me on Skype, your location. Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. Did you catch verse 12 again? You want to speed up Jesus' return to destroy the evil by fire and purify the earth, making it a new earth where only the righteous dwell? You can speed it up. How? Pray more, fast more, love Jesus more. Do more good deeds, sin less, preach and get more people saved, and you're going to speed up that day, making it approach sooner than later. There it is, verse 12. Looking for and hastening, speeding up. Hastening means to speed up the coming of the day of God. And that's what the Blessed Mother did. Jesus said, it's not my hour, but because of your intercession, you now hasten and you speed it up the hour. Though it's meant for later, out of love and honor for you, the hour begins now, sooner than later, due to your intercession, my beloved mother. You caught it? Yeah, Ryan, it's right there. Are you looking 2 Peter 3.12?
Guys, are you reading 2 Peter 3.12? I love what Mr. Deckard said. My heart is moved by the Blessed Mother. Amen. Here, let me show you in the NIV. It's right there, guys. In fact, here, if you go here, Bible Gateway, here is all the major English translations translating 2 Peter 3, verse 12. It's right there. Okay, hastening. I want to see how other translations render it. Hasten, it's coming. Hastening. Hasten it. Let me see if I can find something that's like paraphrases it where you get the point. All right, let's see. Oh, here it goes. GNT. Look at GNT. Good news translation. Here it is. Look. Good news translation. Here you go. Brother, here you go. Ryan. As you wait for the day of God and do your best to make it come soon. It's right there. So there's a mystery in how God acts in time and space. Your obedience, your righteousness, your purity, your love, and your evangelism can speed up God's determined course of action. Okay? That's what the Blessed Mother did as an example for us according to 2 Peter 3.12. See it? It's right there. Hasten it. Now, let me give you the Greek lexicon so people say, oh, so, well, I'm just reading what's there, translated, and I, I have no reason to deny it's an accurate translation of the Greek, but let's just double check because you know how it is with Jamal Muhammad Dwight. See, the Greek, sir. I parse the Greek. It's a paraphrastic phrase, sir. All right. There it is. The word hastening is spidontes. Sounds like speed, speedontes, from the words speedu, speedu. Here it is, speedu, speedu. Let's see what it means. <clears throat> I hasten, urge on, desire, hasten, urge on. And as be hastening, hurried, hurry, hurrying, make haste. There it is, right? There you go, to hasten. As often in the Greek, uh, come with haste, make haste, come down, make haste, get thee quickly out. There it is. It's right there. Caught it? It's a paraphrastic phrase, right? See, you don't know Greek. I can parse the verb, parse the verb and the adverb and the paraphrastic phrase and Okay, so what did you learn in the mystery of God's sovereignty and economy? Because God generally is a living, dynamic being who truly interacts in a dynamic, personal, intimate, miraculous manner with his creatures. The Lord in his love will take your prayers, your deeds, your actions in account and bring it about his perfect will. So though he tells you this day, in the mystery of God's economy, which we can't fully understand, you can either hasten the day, speed it up, or you can prolong it. And the best example is the Blessed Mother. Let me again repeat and end it with the example of the Blessed Mother. Jesus plainly tells her, woman, you're asking me to do something before the appointed time. But because you're my mother and because I love you and I will not dishonor you, I'm going to go ahead and do the miracle thereby speeding up the hour. So though the hour was to begin later, because of your intercession, we speed it up. Father, I, and the Spirit, in perfect union and agreement, in love for you, we speed it up, and we make the hour come about sooner than the appointed time, in love and honor for you. And who agrees? The Father, Son, and Spirit agree to do it, to honor the blessed Theotokos. Got it? Yep, Shula. Mark 13, 19, 20. Are you catching it? Did I say that or did Jesus say that? Did you see it? Didn't Jesus say, woman, what is that between you and me? My hour's not come. And yet he went about and did the miracle anyway. And John 2, 11 said, this was the first of his signs that Jesus did manifesting his glory before his apostles. 
So thanks to the Blessed Mother's intercession, thanks be to the Blessed Mother because of her great status and rank before the Father, Son, and Spirit, because the Father, Son, and Spirit are in love with Theotokos, because she gave to Jesus the flesh, blood, and bones of Jesus, conceived and produced by the Holy Spirit, the eternal love of Jesus and the Father, right? Bringing him into the world through her holy womb, they honored her request and hastened the hour. It's right there, man. I'm not making it up. Now watch Jamal Muhammad White and that fat slob. May the Lord use me to expose him and silence him until he repents. And if he seeks forgiveness and apologizes, we'll forgive him. Anthony Dodgers Rogers tried to brush this away. Paraphrastic, adverb. It's a verb and it's in the imperfect and it's the perfect and it's there you go. Is everyone clear? We got it? So I ended with the best example, my favorite example, and I'll tell you why. And we're going to end it. I hope this was a meat fast. I hope if you enjoyed this meat fast and you are thankful to the Spirit that he would use an imperfect sinner with serious psychological issues like me and work through me perfecting me to be more like Jesus and glorify Jesus and know the word and interpret it accurately as he enables me to exegete and recall scripture perfectly. Let me give us the power to live it out. I hope if this blessed you, then share the links, get more people to listen, but warn them. The guy's not normal. He's He's got a few screws loose. He's not dealing with a full deck. So he manifests, but if you can overcome his manifestations, you'll learn. Because as the Spirit sanctifies me and purifies me and opens my eyes and my ears, and as the Spirit guides me and shows me where I'm wrong and corrects me and gives me the grace to be humble, to admit I'm wrong and confess it and repent of it, and as He gives me more of the truth, to know the truth and empowers me then to know and live out that truth, I will share that truth with you and pour into your lives until Jesus summons me or until He returns. And now, Rusty, God bless you, brother. I hope you're not upset that I... Lovingly rebuke you for focusing too much on original guilt. Original guilt is an isolated teaching held by Calvinists, not taught by the consensus of the fathers, not taught in scripture. Though Augustine may have believed it, neither the Orthodox nor the Catholic go with Augustine on this because he's a minority voice. Okay. Okay. And one thing I can say, and Russell, you know, you're my brother. If I rebuke you, it's in love. It's never serious because you're one of the regulars. One thing I can say to all of you, and I pray the Lord blesses, blesses our numbers. They increase for his glory, not for my praise, and I'm content. I am very disheartened, and I'm disappointed that for over 20 years, because of my Protestant <clears throat> brainwashing, I robbed myself, and I mean this, I was thinking about it today earlier, of the intercession of the Blessed Mother of Theotokos. 20 years I went without believing that she prays, and she prays for, for those who seek her intercession, who love her for the sake of the Lord. Why? Because of my Protestant traditions. For 20 years. Even though as a child, I was taught, the love of Jesus and faith in Christ by a godly grandmother who, when I was around six and a half, taught me the Ave Maria. And I abandoned that for Baptist theology and then Calvinism only to come full circle again to the Blessed Mother and her intercession. And I don't say this to say it in front of you. I mean this. Even in my Protestantism, I still had a connection with her. And I know it's because of that godly grandmother, Shmuni, who I believe is in heaven, glorified with Christ. She put the love of Theotokos in my heart. And it stayed with me because I would think about her. And I can say this, and I'm not saying it in front of you. I'm just saying it to be true. I love her more than any creature. Creature. Of all the apostles, I love Paul, but I love her the most. I love her more than my daughters. I love her more than my mother. I love her more than any creature because she is the mother of my Lord who gave my Lord his flesh and blood and bones. 
And what's amazing to me is he had no human father, which means if you saw him and her, for all intents and purposes, he was most likely her twin because he got his entire human DNA and his human makeup and looks just from her and her alone. It isn't like you and I, we look like our mother and father. He had no earthly father. He totally looked like his beloved mother. And tradition says she was over 14 when she birthed him. So that means when Jesus was 30, she would have been around 45. They would have looked like brother and sister. You understand? Because she was young. So when our Lord was 30, she would have been around 45. Right? So they would have looked like brother and sister. And Jesus absolutely loves and adores her. Because he absolutely loves and adores her. If you love Jesus and adore Jesus, you love and adore what and who he loves and adores. And he's in love with his mother. And because I love Jesus more than anything, though I fail him, I love his mother the most more than any creature. I love her more than my daughters. I love her more than my mother. And my prayer, and I mean this, if God, by the blood of Jesus, purifies me and the Spirit seals me and fills me, ushers me in to heaven if the Lord tarries, and if my Lord Jesus is pleased, after seeing Christ, and allowing me to kiss his feet and kiss his face if he allows me. The first person I want to see after him is not my mother. I want to see the Theotokos. And then the second is Paul. I want to see her among all the creatures after the Lord. And if the Lord will allow me to have his blessed mother hug me and embrace me. And then I want to see my hero, Paul. And if the Lord allows me to kiss Paul and hug Paul and say, Paul, for the sake of Jesus, I love you because the Lord used you on earth to give us these books from which we came to know our faith. And my desire was to love Jesus the way you did. You were my hero on earth and you are my older brother. I want to see them too after I see the Lord and then see everyone else. Right. So that's my hope. And I love and adore her. And if God is pleased to use me and he gives me breath and strength and health and holiness and purity and boldness and not let me be a coward and control my tongue and mouth to never betray or deny or blaspheme or disown Jesus with my breath, with my life and health, I will do all I can to defend her honor. And to defend the honor of my Lord, though the Lord doesn't need me, it is my honor to defend his glory, though he doesn't need me to do it. May the Spirit use me and to defend the honor of the Blessed Mother, Theotokos, the Mother of God, <clears throat> Panagia, the All-Holy, Eparthenos, ever-Virgin, Virgin of Virgins, Queen of Angels. The queen mother, queen of queens, my beloved mother, our beloved mother, pray for us. So there you go, guys. We're done. You got all you need. We're done. So if you believe the Lord is using me, guys, please, covenant. Some of you know intercessory prayer warriors. Some of you are intercessory prayer warriors. Pray hard for my daughters and I. Ask the Lord to grant my daughters and I miraculous supernatural physical strength. Health, I stay healthy and fit and get healthier if the Lord tarries so that my health will not hinder me. Save me from falling into bondage to food and obesity and lust. And see my daughters grow up to be godly women. Ask the Lord to grant them salvation and keep me in love with Jesus and holy and pure. And help me to grow and teach more. And heal me of my imperfections. And ask the Lord to provide financially to do the ministry so I can take care of them. To finish the race with integrity. And if the Lord is pleased, I will continue to serve you until the Lord summons me. May we remain ever faithful to Jesus. And let me remind you, for some of us this Thanksgiving, we won't have families to celebrate with. But let me end it with this again. I read it last night, but I'll remind you guys. And if you believe the Lord's using ministry, get more people to come, like, and watch. And the Lord give me contentment. Let me read, let me read this for you guys. Ready? Okay. 
Luke 14, 7 to 14. You ready? Luke 14, 7 to 14. It's Thanksgiving. Let us be doers of the word and pray that I practice what I preach. I'm not a hypocrite. I obey and do what Jesus tells me to do because Jesus wants to live his life in and through you. Jesus wants to speak through your mouth and use your hands and feet. That's Galatians 2.20. If you think I'm lying, Galatians chapter 2, verse 20 says, I have been crucified with Christ, and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I live, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. So what is Paul saying? I let Jesus live through me, live his life through me, manifest his life through me using my body to be his vehicle. Let Jesus take control and work in and through me to glorify him. More of him, less of me. To live the way Jesus did and manifest Christ by our deeds. That's Galatians 2.20. But let me end this with an exhortation for those of you celebrating Thanksgiving. Luke 14, 7 to 14. The key verses will be 12 to 14. But watch, I'm going to read it. So he told the parable to those who are invited. Because our Lord was invited, right? To the house of one of the rulers of the Pharisees. So he was invited. And so now he's using a parable to chide that Pharisee and those who thought they were special and better than others. So he told the parable to those who were invited. When he noted how they chose the best places, saying to them. So, you know, you're invited, so you go to the best seat. When you are invited by anyone to a wedding feast, do not sit down in the best place, lest one more honorable than you be invited by him. And he invited you and him come and say to you, give place to this man, and then you begin with shame to take the lowest place. What he's saying is, don't be so arrogant, so puffed up thinking you're special. Humble yourself and let others exalt you. Because let's say you go to a wedding and you sit at the best seat. And then someone says, sorry, sir, that's reserved for him. You're going to be humiliated. So don't be so full of yourself and think you're so special. Let others exalt you. Don't exalt yourself. May we practice that. Now watch here. But when you are invited, go and sit down in the lowest place. So that when he who invited you comes, he may say to you, friend, go up higher. Hey, what are you doing here, man? No, no, no. Your seat is over there. Let someone exalt you. Don't exalt yourself. Then you will have glory in the presence of those who sit at the table with you. Exactly. If the one who invited you, the master of the event, or let's say the bridegroom says, hey, no, no, no. Your seat is over there. People are going to say, wow, who is this guy that he's so special that he got honored in this way? See what the Lord is saying? And this is why he says, right? Then you'll have glory in the presence of those who sit at the table with you. Whoever exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. Now, here's the key. Guys, can you pray for me, if you love me, to practice what I preach and pray for one another? Practice the words of Christ. Let us be doers of the word, because here's where you're going to get blown away. Luke 14, Luke 14. 12 to 14. Watch this, guys. Okay, watch this. I want you to watch this and get ready to be blown away. This is Jesus, the heart of Jesus, the beauty of Jesus, because Jesus is beauty. Beauty became a man. His name is Jesus. He is humbleness and love. Look what he says to we, the body of Christ. Then he also said to him who invited him, when you give a dinner, guys, practice the words of Christ. Let's be doers of the word. Look what he says, guys. When you, when you give a dinner or a supper, do not ask your friends, your brothers, your relatives, nor rich neighbors, lest they also invite you back and you be repaid. Don't just invite your family or people who are well-to-do, who then can return the favor and invite you. Don't do that. That's what the world does. Notice the heart of Jesus. But when you give a feast, invite the poor. See the heart of your Lord? He's beautiful. He is beauty in the flesh. He's pure love. And he's real. This Jesus walked there, this earth and said these words. And he's alive and he's coming. He's real. And this is his heart. But when you give a feast, invite the poor. The maimed. The lame, the blind. And you will be blessed. Because they cannot repay you. For you shall be repaid. It moves me in my spirit at the resurrection of the just. Then he also said to him, invited him, when you give a dinner, 
right? <clears throat> or a supper, do not ask your friends, your brothers, your relatives, nor rich neighbors, lest they also invite you back and you be repaid. But when you give a feast, invite the poor, the maimed, the lame, the blind. Why? And you, this is Jesus. He cannot lie. These are the words of the real Jesus, historical Jesus, because these are his words, his actions. And this Jesus is alive. Look at all these testimonies, these Muslim women that you heard. Jesus appearing to them in dreams and visions. Or this Jewish woman who saw Jesus and God the Father. Confirmation of what the Bible says. He's alive and death is not the end of us. And he will come to judge the living and the dead. Let's be ready. So he says to you, all of you. But when you give a feast, invite the poor. The maimed. The lame. The blind. Now here, this is where it moves me. And you will be blessed because they cannot repay you. They can't repay you. They can't invite you back to their home. But guess who's going to repay you? For you shall be repaid at the resurrection of the just. I will repay you. This is why it moves me in my spirit. We owe Jesus our life. He doesn't have to repay us anything. He owns us. This is our duty. He doesn't have to repay us for doing what we were created to do. But in his love, he says, though I own you and this is your duty to obey me, I will still reward you for obeying me. And I will repay you for showing kindness to them. When you feed that poor, I will repay you. When you invite and show hospitality to the blind or the maimed, I myself will repay you for them. Because this is my heart. This is your Jesus. This is my Jesus. Infinitely beautiful. He is beauty in the flesh. Christ has died. Christ has risen. Christ will come again. Jesus Christ is ever living. Jehovah in the flesh, the love of the Father, the heart of the Spirit, our love, our Lord, our heart, our life. Lord Jesus, wash, purify, cleanse us. Our loved ones, my daughters, please, in your blood. Fill my daughters, fill our loved ones, fill us with your Spirit and keep us in love with you. And Lord Jesus, this Thanksgiving, our home is your home. Not only are you invited, you own our home. And bring my daughters to me and keep us in love with you. And help me to stay fit and holy and bless us. In the name of the Father and of the Son of the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. Father, have mercy. Son of God, have mercy. Holy Spirit, have mercy. Theotokos, pray for us. <clears throat> Saint Paul, pray for us. Saint Peter, pray for us. Saint Stephen, pray pray for us. Saint Michael, pray for us. Saint Gabriel, pray for us. You host of heaven, you glorified saints, pray for us. Saint Jerome, pray for us. In Jesus' name, amen.